let the record reflect that on Cultural Heritage Board, all board members are uh, present except for Chair DeShazo and board member DeBacher. And on Design Review Board, all board members are present except for board members Weigel and Zuko. Yeah, John McHugh, now we're live, thank you. Yeah. Let, the, let the record reflect that for Cultural Heritage Board, John McHugh is absent also. And for the recording and those listening on TV, the meeting was called to order previous to roll call. Um, <clears throat> moving on to board business. This is where uh, Vice Chair Purser and I will read um, the purpose of both of our boards. Uh, statement of purpose per zoning code chapter 20-52.030F, project review. The review authority shall consider the location, design, site plan configuration, and the overall effect of the proposed project upon surrounding properties and the city in general. Review shall be conducted by comparing the proposed project to the general plan, any applicable specific plan, applicable zoning code standards and requirements, consistency of the project within the city's design guidelines, architectural criteria for special areas, and other applicable city requirements. And I will turn it over. All right, Chair. thank you. Um, uh, the Cultural Heritage Board's statement of purpose reads as follows. The Cultural Heritage Board shall consider the following matters, standards, guidelines, and criteria to the extent applicable in determining whether to grant or deny a permit to it whether the, per the proposed change is consistent or incompatible with the architectural period of the building, whether the proposed change is compatible with any adjacent or nearby landmark structures or preservation district structures, whether the colors, textures, materials, fenestration, decorative features, and details proposed are consistent with the period and or are compatible with adjacent structures, whether the proposed change destroys or adversely affects an important architectural feature or features. And then finally, we are charged to consider the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation and Guidelines for Rehabilitating Historic Buildings. Such other matters, uh, criteria, and standards as may be adopted by resolution of the Cultural Heritage Board. Thank you. And now I would like to move on to public comment. I will uh, open the hearing for public comment. This is a time when any person may address matters not listed on the agenda, but within the subject matter of the jurisdiction, i.e. Design Review Board or Cultural Heritage Board. Uh, the public may comment on agendized items as they come up. And uh, you'll have three minutes. Right now I've got one card for Dwayne DeWitt, but if you haven't filled out a card, uh, please feel free to speak uh, after Mr. DeWitt's time. Uh, just raise your hand and give us your name at the podium. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. Good New Year to you all. I wanted to <clears throat> talk with you about a very important matter involving Roseland, which has now been a part of the city in some places for many decades and in other places for 14 to 15 months. And the dilemma is now in this deregulated disaster capitalism atmosphere that we have, people are just rushing forward to go and do projects without necessarily looking at the cultural heritage that Roseland has had for over a century. Roseland's been around as long as Santa Rosa and yet Santa Rosa pretty much controls the way things go. The dilemma that we face is that we're basically a disadvantaged, underserved, and overburdened community that essentially is an afterthought in almost everything that boards, commissions, and city employees do. It's something that I've been talking about for a long time, but I don't really know if it's ever had any effect. And I'm hoping that maybe in the next few years, there may be an opportunity for authentic community engagement with Roseland residents 
to do what Roseland folks would like to see happen with their cultural heritage, with their buildings that they see as important. An example that some of you may not know is called Bear Farm. Bear Farmhouse was a beautiful place, and it was a spot that everyone who lived in Roseland knew about because it was still a nice farm in the center of Roseland. When the city decided that they would do a park there, because of some um, nebulous comments about there may be asbestos, they tore the farmhouse down, even though citizens wanted it to stay pretty much. And it was like, well, that's just the way it goes. Then we got ourselves a really lot of concrete. They came in and put down more concrete than you could imagine in that former area of the farm. Left a little garden off to the side, put some money into a barn, and said, oh yeah, that's important. But they don't let anybody use the barn. And then they built a really expensive building out there that you have to rent if you want to use it. You can't use the bathrooms in the rental unit unless you rented it. You can use porta potties. Now, is that any way to treat a community that you've just welcomed into Santa Rosa? Say, hey, you know, you can't use the bathrooms we built. You got to rent them, but we got a porta potty over there for you. And that's how most folks think, at least in Roseland, that you're treating us, that we're just essentially the afterthought porta potty, and that we need to get some kind of voice here with you folks. So I'm hoping you folks will start to tell staff, because that's what it's all about, the entrenched bureaucracy. They control everything, not us, maybe not even you. But at least if you were to put it into writing and say that, yes, you wanna make sure that Roseland residents have a voice in saving our cultural heritage out there, and that it should be something that's looked at when any project comes forward involving the Roseland area, which some of you may know is 1.2 square miles reaching from the other side of the freeway, right over there, all the way out to Stony Point Road, and all the way down to Hearn Avenue. It's a lovely area, and I'm hoping someday in the future you'll get to come see it. We once did a tour on Rosie the tour bus and brought out members of a redevelopment project uh, area committee and city staff to come and actually see some of Roseland where they never go. And we've brought the bicycle advisory committee on a bike ride through some of it, and I'm off to see them because through some quirk of scheduling, they're also meeting at the same time as you. But I may be able to stay for an item or two. Just in case I'm not able to, help Mr. Derringer get his project up and running, and for scoping of the downtown specific plan, let the people in on it, not just what staff wants. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt, and thank you for joining us on the walking tour today and uh, continuing with the discussion. I believe uh, everybody uh, enjoyed the walking tour and Patrick's given uh, several of them. And so I think your point to bringing people out to the Roseland area and seeking public input is a, is a good one. So thanks for bringing that up. All right, I'm in. Okay, uh, moving on. Statements of abstentions by board members. Do we have any abstentions from my board? Seeing none, I will move it over to your board. Any abstentions, anyone? Um, I think for item two, this is a pre we've seen this project come through before. So those of you who um, noted that you had done site visits in the past, those will still stand. Yes. Thank you, that's a good point. Okay, well then moving on to item 7.1, study session for the downtown station area specific plan, update scope and visioning. I'll turn it over to Patrick. Thank you, Chair Kincaid, Vice Chair Purser and members of the boards. I'm Patrick Streeter with the Planning and Economic Development Department and the um, item before you is a study session for the downtown station area specific plan update. Um, we do have a downtown station area specific plan. It was adopted in 2007, and the purpose of the plan was to create a vision um, and a development path for the area around the uh, future Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit Smart Station. It was a 20-year plan. Part of the vision was roughly 3,400 new units within the plan area. Um, we are now halfway into the plan's lifetime, and only 100 units have been realized. While we've had um, a little more success 
coming towards the vision of um, non-residential development. So we're a little less than halfway there as far as non-residential floor area. The plan has not been realized in the way that it was intended um, 11 years ago. And so part of this project is to update the plan and, and try to determine where there were stumbling blocks in the plan, but also to make it a plan that is more appropriate for the, the current time and current conditions in the city. Um, this came about because earlier in 2018, the council during goal setting adopted a new set of priorities. They included downtown development and downtown housing as tier one priorities. In response, staff applied for and received a grant through the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, MTC, um, and that's a planning grant. And the purpose was to open up the downtown specific plan and um, prepare an update. A, um, a request for proposals was issued and the planning and consult consulting firm Diet and Baccia was selected. Um, so I do have members of our consultant team present for this presentation and answering questions as well. It's important to note that the downtown station area as far as the plan goes um, extends far beyond just the courthouse square that's thought of as the downtown core or railroad square which is thought of as the historic downtown. Um, it includes several residential neighborhoods, it includes preservation districts, um, and it includes commercial corridors. The original plan was focused around the smart station which is now in operation and the vision was for walkable transit-oriented development. So it looked at um, development within walking distance, which is considered typically a half mile of the, of the transit station, um, and had a vision for pedestrian-friendly development, uh, as well as the commercial and residential development that I had mentioned earlier. As part of this plan, we are still looking at the smart station, but we're extending our perspective to also include the downtown transit mall, um, which is adjacent to Courthouse Square, or to, uh, yeah, Courthouse Square. And um, as part of that, we are extending the boundary of the plan area. It previously ended on D Street? Um, uh, no. e. e Street and we'll be ex expanding it to the east to um, reach out to Brookwood Avenue. Um, that's also consistent with our definition of the downtown core in the general plan. So the scope of this update involves um, 10 t different tasks. One of them is the project commencement and um, community engagement strategy. We are commencing the project now. Uh, last week, the project went before council and they adopted our community engagement strategy. Um, task two is the, creation, is the background analysis. So uh, putting together what's called a um, priority development area profile, that's a requirement from MTC as part of the grant. Um, and also determining what the existing conditions are um, so that will inform us on how the plan can move forward. Task three is a component of the project throughout. So um, during the, the planning of even beginning this uh, update, but now that we're in the update, uh, community outreach and engagement is a major component. Um, we feel that we, um, as staff, learned some valuable lessons from the Roseland specific plan, which was recently done, the annexation specific plan. Um, and so we hope to utilize the lessons learned from that outreach, which we consider to have been successful. and. Um, cast an even broader net with, with this um, and, and develop even more engagement as part of this process. Um, we would then develop land use and circulation alternatives. So um, basically how the plan is going to look forward um, and some different options on how we would do that, how we'd approach, approach the plan. Then based on feedback from our boards and commissions, from staff and from our various forms of outreach, we would settle on what's called a preferred plan. So that's the one that we're going to then invest the, the analysis into. Um, we would do an analysis on infrastructure and services. That's to make sure that the plan is feasible, uh, which would result in our draft downtown station area plan. So that would be the draft of the plan, again, sent out for comment um, to try to try to refine it at that point and to the, the type of plan that's going to be best realizing the city's vision, but also something that's feasible that can be implemented. 
the zoning regulations and general plan would be amended to then incorporate that plan, and that extends beyond just those two documents, our bicycle and pedestrian master plan, our creek master plan, um, the, the city bus routes, kind of everything that's adopted will be updated to be consistent with that plan. We would do the necessary environmental analysis associated with it. So as was mentioned, there is an existing plan, so some of that analysis has been done. So we'd look at the, the delta, the change in what's being proposed and, and what sort of an environmental analysis needs to be done to um, accommodate those changes to the plan. And lastly, there'll be one final outreach for comment, um, and then it'll be before our planning commission for recommendation and the council for final adoption of the specific plan. We have an aggressive schedule. Typically, uh, plans of this type could take two years and up. Um, the fastest we've done it has been 18 months. We're looking to have this plan completed uh, by the end of summer, early fall. So it is an aggressive timeline, and typically um, our boards and commissions see the plan when we're at that draft plan phase that I had mentioned previously. So this is a, a new way of, of approaching it, is bringing it forward at the very beginning so we can, we can get the input and um, catch any red flags, but also get an understanding of, of where we should be going with this plan at the very beginning. So last week we had a joint meeting of the planning commission and the council this week, we're meeting with Cultural Heritage Board and Design Review Board, and we'll also be forming a community advisory committee, um, which will be members of the community to kind of act as ambassadors and bring in information from the broader community and also disseminate that information. So we'll be having a meeting of that group pretty soon, as well as stakeholder interviews and workshops to, to really get as many voices around the table as we can, as early as we can. And so that's a, a rough idea of the scope. The, the purpose of this meeting is really to present it to these boards to receive your comments. Um, first, we'd address any questions that the boards might have, then to ultimately receive the comments and, um, and get an understanding of, of where you'd like to see the project moving forward. And so that can be broad as far as broad policy concerns, down to specific, hey, there's a, a parcel over here that you might want to look at, there's something unique about it, um, or, pet projects that you'd like to see made part of this plan. We want it all, that's the purpose of this study session. Um, as I said, I'm available, uh, Jessica Jones is also available for questions, and we have um, Andrew Hill and Steve Cancion from our consultant group as well. Great, thank you, Patrick. Um, before I open up for public comment, I think I'll take questions from the board, that way it might uh, envelop some more dialogue about what, uh, where we go from here. So we'll start with my board if that's okay. And then, all right. Sabra, any questions for staff? This is an aggressive schedule, and I find myself wondering um, how you're going to be able to really pull in the communities. Many of the people who live in and near this area are not regular participants in city government. Um, so there's a barrier to break through right there. And uh, relying on electronic communications is also a barrier because many of the people who live in this area are either way too busy to deal with a slew of emails or they are people who are not interested in um, living right next to their smartphone to get things from the city. So. Uh, they're not going to sign up. You're not going to get their names. How are you going to find them? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, as I mentioned, outreach is a major component of this project, and we are looking at um, barriers to, to getting voices around the table. So, like I said, there were many lessons learned from Roseland, so one of those is the hours. So if we have a workshop in the middle of the day, we're not going to get all the voices around the table. So it's, it's catering to other people's schedules, not city staffs. It's providing things like childcare and food, um, but also the as far as getting the message out, the community advisory committee. Um, it's not a steering committee. It's not a decision-making body. The purpose is to um, bring representatives in from as many groups as possible. And so we're looking at um, the preservation districts. We're looking at the council districts. We're looking at business owners, but we're also reaching beyond Santa Rosa. So we're looking at potential users of the downtown, transit riders, um, employment centers, people who are 
retirement age and downsizing or students who are looking to strike out on their own. So we're trying to cast a broad net and through the Community Advisory Committee, having representatives from those groups um, as part of our, our process at the table, then being able to go out and and spread the message and, and, and spur engagement, get, get their groups to be a part of the process through our different outreach types. Um, and I would also add to that, um, again, kind of building on what we did with the Roseland specific plan and annexation, um, we went out to people. Um, you know, there was a, a large community there that also, same with this, does not typically get involved in these types of of meetings um, and projects. Uh, so we went to them. We went door to door, knocking on doors, handing out flyers um, to get people to come to our meetings. We also reached out to neighborhood groups and um, asked if we could come to them to, to meet with them. So we sat in people's backyards um, and answered questions and provided information. Uh, we went to businesses and sat in their um, banquet rooms and, and chatted with them. And like Patrick said, you know, we really tried to um, do this at all different hours of the day, days of the week with, uh, you know, various amenities like, you know, breakfast at breakfast time, you know, snacks at snack time, dinners, whatever, um, and providing the child care and, and things for kids to do. So um, it, we, it, it was an extremely successful process with Roseland and we intend to bring that to this process and go beyond. You tell the, you know, fundamentally, the principle behind it is you don't ask people to come to the mountain, you bring the mountain to people. Um, so I'd be interested, um, Commissioner Member, if you have any suggestions of other places and ways, so, you know, because we, it's all about um, starting where people are at and engaging them where they're comfortable. I would personally piggyback on some of the existing places that people congregate, uh, people from all levels, so mm -hmm. I'd go to the libraries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that, and that's another aspect of this is that we won't just be holding workshops and meetings and asking people to come to us. Uh, we, we will be going to any events that are happening in and around the downtown as well as other places throughout the city because really downtown is is the entire city's downtown. So, you know, if uh, wherever there is an event, that's again, the same thing we did with Roseland. If there was an event, we were there with our information and, and gathering information from other people. So uh, that's another way that we will be doing it. So libraries, um, as you can, um, connect with people who will act as ambassadors, who will communicate with their neighborhoods. I would consider doing a presentation in front of uh, school PTOs. Um, the, having a safe, energized downtown makes families happy. Any other questions? Eric? Thank you. I applaud uh, the the city's effort to be as aggressive in its timeline because it helps show our commitment to uh, making this a priority. So I uh, greatly appreciate that. The one one of the questions I have is the I've lost track of the current status of the downtown special assessment tax. I'm not sure if I'm using the correct term and. Can you tell me what the status of that is and how that might be folded into the study? Uh, there was a certain downtown area that was gonna be, I think for businesses that was gonna be taxed per square foot, if that rings a bell. So yeah, that that has um, moved forward. It's I think it's being assessed um, and they, I think the first visible sign of it you'll see is they'll have, um, they're actually calling them ambassadors as well, they'll have, um, Downtown ambassadors that will be on the on the streets, so that's probably the the first visible sign of that district that you'll see. Um, but it is it's in operation presently, and we do have um, a downtown subcommittee for our council. They meet once a month, and as part of this process, we'll be delivering updates to them. Um, but that's also a, a good it's a public meeting, and it's a good opportunity to hear kind of the other initiatives that are taking place downtown and get updates from those as well. Thank you. And then um, the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, Downtown Merchants Association, where do they play a role in this in this study? So that that's a stakeholder group that we are, are talking to right now, um, and that would be 
Um, again, casting the broad net, that's, that's one of those stakeholder groups that we're trying to get as much input from as we can. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And uh, I was remiss in not uh, welcoming a new board member earlier, so I'll do that now before I call on him to speak. Uh, Adam Sharon has joined us, um, so thank you for participating in short notice and being at the meeting today. We'll value your input. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, a couple of uh, uh, thoughts. Um, you You have, addressed uh, kind of to piggyback of, off what Sabra and Eric talked about in terms of outreach. Um, uh, I'm curious about, you, you mentioned lesson learn, lessons learned from the Roseland outreach effort. Um, if you could expound upon that, things that you're gonna be maybe doing differently or you know, incorporating into um, this new effort because it is a, it's pretty aggressive, which is, is great in this timeline. Um, and then my second um, thought is, uh, <clears throat> any, any, uh, any thoughts of increasing the, uh, the outreach? You know, you've mentioned citywide, but you know, we are the county seat also of, of interfacing. You know, is there any discussions with other cities? Is there any you know, going to farmers markets in other towns or with schools? You know, because we are that regional center. Are we bringing the, you know, where are the cities downtown, but we're in, the, in essence the, you know, the county's downtown too. So any thoughts about doing that? I know that that's really reaching far afield, but yeah, thank you. Sure, I can uh, touch on the Roseland piece. Uh, I was the project manager for that, so I have a little bit of knowledge. Um, I would say that uh, I, I don't know that we had a negative um, aspect to that. I think it was all positive, and I think if you talk to most people, they would tell you that. Um, it was uh, a, a journey for us. You know, we started uh, before we started that process. Um, most of the time, we were doing kind of the typical planning process, which was uh, workshops, mailed notices and not much else. Um, and so we really um, you know, tried to work very hard and we worked very closely with our community engagement office um, and uh, Steve Kansian was a part of our um, group uh, going through that process as well. Um, and he has a, a lot of knowledge um, from you know living and uh, growing up here as well, and so uh, it was it was really just about trying to understand that community um, and figure out how we could reach the people that just generally don't come to our meetings, um, and so we learned through that process what worked, and um, I, I really don't feel like we had a sense of what didn't work because it, it most of what we tried worked. It was you know, on the ground, knocking on doors, going to people, going to PTA meetings, uh, sitting, like I said, in people's backyards. Um, and really that was the core of what worked well. Um, and that's what we want to build upon. I just had one example that complements what Jessica just added was, so we, what we, one of the things we could have learned was to be flexible to respond to what we heard. So we had successful initial workshops. One of the things we heard were there were some very particular concerns um, that had to do with how long grandfathered industrial uses remain grandfathered if they were empty, and it quickly gets very technical if you're not one of those people, or to what degree you could or couldn't have a mobile vent food vendor near a restaurant, and it quickly gets very technical. So. The workshops worked to surface that, but what we did differently then in Rosen is we then actually went out and talked to folks cart to cart and then had meetings in restaurants and we walked the streets between Sebastopol and the 12 and there's a whole world back there if you, if you haven't walked all the little streets and talked to folks and then had a meeting of people who have those in small industrial uses. So, it, and we couldn't have recognized that before we started. So it's that flexibility to respond to what turn out to be the particular issues that people really care about that you might not have known it, and then what's the right forum for the people that it affects, and where do you sit? So it turns out that, you know, SNS Trucking, Skikos, is a great place to have a meeting if you want to sit with light industrialists, right? You know, or La Fondita if you want to sit with the restaurant community. Sure, and that's <clears throat> that, that's really great that you're you're talking about doing 
really going to the to the people. Another thought, and I'm certain you're thinking about it, with especially with downtown, you've got daytime population, nighttime population, you know, and just really being certain to address those things. So. And if I may ask, Commissioner, there are, in terms of the county, we're obviously um, we're working to use taxpayer taxpayers' resources very carefully, sure. right? So, yeah. um, would you have particular suggestions on how we could concisely capture some of that county perspective? I'm not sure, and I'm not certain. You know, being you know pretty green at this meeting as well, um, yeah. you know how those resources can be allocated if they need to be within city limits, you know, things like that. But, you know, really just thinking about cooperation with other municipalities mm -hmm. and with, you know, unincorporated county, I'm wondering if that's possible because people do come here and then, you know. Yeah, and the, the scope of our outreach does go beyond current residents who are looking at future residents. So that includes evolving Sonoma State. Yeah. Um, I was at a, um, a meeting of the North Bay Yimbies the other night. Um, <laughs> And so, so we handed out information on the project there, and, and a lot of the participants there are not Santa Rosa residents, but they are very much involved in Santa Rosa's downtown as Sonoma County residents or North Bay residents. So we are, we are expanding the net beyond the city limits, and, and we'll look for different avenues that we can do that. Okay, yeah, I mean, especially with the, the focal point of, of Courthouse Square now, it's, you know, that regional, it's ideally pulling everyone in, you know, so. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Sorry, one follow-up question. Your comments made me think of it was, uh, are you also reaching out to some of the local government agencies, such as the County of Sonoma was looking at putting the courthouse downtown, talking to the Postal Service, the state, the state for the state building, the feds for the fed building, because I'm not sure those are so solid or maybe in transition uh, and certainly can make a major change with downtown. So how do you, is that the plan to reach out to them and, and get them in at least their input for some of the scope of the study? Yeah, so I mentioned our community advisory committee. Another group that we're putting together is a technical advisory committee. And the purpose of that is to bring in expertise from different agencies. So we'll have the city departments, the uh, transportation, public works, planning, economic development, but it'll also include uh, county departments, It'll include um, agencies like SMART and Sonoma County Transit. Um, so that, that's an opportunity to, to bring those other agencies to the same table as well. So it's, um, we're doing the community outreach to get the, the residents and the community members, and then the technical advisory committee is kind of a way to get those different agencies and jurisdictions involved as well. So, and, and we also have, uh, beyond just the downtown specific plan update, there are a number of downtown initiatives going on. Um, we have a, a website called Up Downtown that has a lot of information on it, um, but our, uh, uh, the economic wing of our planning and economic development department um, is working very closely with the county and, and others on um, all of those sites that you mentioned um, and the potential to um, bring county services downtown and, and others, um, other ideas about, you know, uh, revitalizing our downtown with housing and whatnot. So yeah, we, we are in constant contact with all of those various agencies. Warren? I wanted to uh, thank staff for the, the continuing vision of, of downtown, and I had a couple questions and thoughts. Um, on a capital basis, I know there's task number six, which is about capital. Um, when you look at infrastructure, there's appears to be there, there's two major motions. One is uh, we already have with a square proper city is theater and it's it's a place at night to convene have cultural exchange city as work city at housing don't necessarily have to be at odds but i'm familiar with all the various thoughts of the county perhaps the county facility is a place for housing and the downtown is a place for civicness one of the models since you're you're thinking about other cities um many many years ago um actually in the in the 1800s Emeryville was a, a free-spirited place. It was, it was sanctioned. Pixar chose Emeryville because of its fluidness, its flexibility. It, it had a lot of transit. It brought jobs. The capital that came from a private sector group versus 
a government sector, and, and I'm looking at Ashley here because the mechanisms legally to engage the federal government, the state, and the county, and how that nexus works over time and how you pay back. You don't, you don't build a 40-story building to house the government and not have a payback schedule. It's, it's not a, a free fall. But the whole question about whether a significant new employer might be closer to Santa Rosa. Would, would an employer on the county campus have jobs there and housing be downtown? Or is the mix some kind of a blend of the two in the downtown? I know um, the health of the downtown has often been aspiring to people living downtown. As, as a, and, and we can talk about all kinds of communities, Europe and, and here. So the question about how to balance housing and how to look at high-rise buildings with uh, a whole different code structure and how to, um, one of your tasks in your, in your um, schedule is building prototypes. It's kind of a February task, see that alternatives in your chart. Um, in, in a perfect world, there is an understanding of how expensive it is to build buildings, who the owners of the buildings are, who the players are, what compels people to be downtown. And if it's a town that's gonna to be governed where there's civility and there's not too many more policemen, not that I, don't, I love policemen, but instead of three times the police, if it's only half again as many police, people living there has a capacity to quell, and I'm sure you're nodding your heads because you know of, of uh, uh, Santa Monica's redo, housing came in, uh, a little less theft, um, so this is a wide open discussion that ties back to how to finance this, how to compel people. It's obvious if Pixar is an employer here, and I, I know Mr. Lasseter lost his job, he's gonna find it, there's a new job for him and maybe he choose Santa Rosa, maybe you don't want him, but carefully said, the, uh, the, the, story, is, the story is that um, compelling culture to be here and to have some fertile reason to be proud of being in Santa Rosa, to be excited to work here. I'm not sure if the blend is 20% employment and 80% housing, but it begs the question because this new gauge, as, as we step this up, it's, it's a, call it a nine month cycle or a year, the capital involved to build all the pipes, the, the pipes will go from 12 inches to 48 inches or whatever to, to make buildings that are 28 stories high. That capital has to be in place, as I understand it legally. You can't just happily handshake a developer and here's your site, you go for it, 30 stories. And if the pipes aren't there, if it's not guaranteed by the city, then that's a problem. And so I'm trying to invite the conversation potentially of jobs that are private sector that culturally enrich um, the community at large. And perhaps those discussions being open to the county so that real things can happen. And then there is a question mark at the end of that. Yeah, somewhere. there's a question mark. Somewhere, there is yeah. a question mark. Um, so one thing I would say is that, um, so we do have the infrastructure development piece of this in step uh, six that you mentioned. Um, also, uh, a part of the specific plan, one of the chapters in the specific plan, which is a grant requirement and something that we want as a city is the implementation chapter. And that will outline how this plan will get implemented, including all of the infrastructure pieces, um, how and when that will happen, um, how it will be paid for, uh, and what city departments or outside agencies or developers would be uh, required to uh, participate in that. And just to add to that, um, speaking about employers we are looking at looking out and reaching out to the existing employers in the in the city of Santa Rosa so we have uh, a pretty vibrant tech industry as well as healthcare industry um, and education and so those those industries are looking for places for their employees to live so they've been a part of the conversation um, even prior to this specific plan but definitely as we move forward with the plan any more questions Warren Okay, I got a couple of questions. Um, so um, we're 10 years into the plan, let's call it, and we got a grant and so we're looking to update the plan. So does the plan then just take us to the end of the original plan at, so 10 more years or where, do, where are we stopping? Where are we thinking at this point in time? 
Andrew, do you have a vision for that? I don't, I don't think it's, it's been defined yet, but. Uh, um, it hasn't been defined, but it's uh, generally good practice to align with the regional planning, and right now everyone's looking out to 2040, so I think it makes sense um, to probably extend the horizon out to 2040. Okay. And then, um, this is just kind of an oddball question, I think, as I look at it um, for the past 15 minutes, but so you've got a grant and it says, you know, you need to be near transit and so we're gonna go half a mile radius around the smart and we're gonna go half a mile radius around the um, bus depot. Um, I'm just wondering, you, and we study that area as kind of the centric circles and then you can't just kind of say, well, and then it'll all work outside of it. So where does, how does that play into it as far as you know, you're halfway into one neighborhood and you kind of are stopping, not really, I know, but just explain kind of how that process takes place. Yeah, so the, the, the policies that come out of this plan will be applicable to the areas within that plan boundary, but as part of development of this plan and the analysis, we're looking at the adjacencies and we are, um, as was mentioned with the composition of the CAC, it's, it's not just the people that are living downtown, it's people that could be living downtown or that are using downtown. Um, so, so that's the, the, the plan area boundary is more, here's where our focus is going to be. And as we update plans and create regulations, they'll be applicable to that area. But the analysis is going to be based um, citywide and regionally, regionally as well. Great, thank you. Turn it over to the uh, Cultural Heritage Board. All right, thank you very much. Questions, I'm gonna start in the same way at the other end of the table. So Anne, if you got some questions for us. Yes, I do. Thank you very much for the great walk today. It was really a lot of fun. <laughs> um, in this downtown station area, uh, you do realize that you have six historical districts, and how is this going to affect them? So as I mentioned, we, we will have representation of each of those districts on our community advisory committee. Um, and those members would act as ambassadors. So the idea is not just those six people representing those districts, it's also to, to broadly reach out and try to get as much participation as we can. Um, also, part of the consultant firm that we chose, part of the appeal, was that they do have um, historic resource experts on staff, and that's gonna be a component of this plan as well. And Andrew, if you wanna touch on that a little bit. There we go. Uh, as one of the, the second task that um, Patrick highlighted today involves the background research and so a big component of that is documenting um, exist, existing historical resources. Um, and so uh, Paige and Turnbull is on the team to, um, to, to do that work. And that really lays the foundation for the discussion going forward. So right from the beginning, it's part of the considerations. All right, John. So this is directed to Patrick. Um, you mentioned there's been a very a lackluster response to the first plan. Um, maybe 50% of it has been implemented and it's been mostly in commercial development. As part of this new plan, are you following up to, uh, with people who pulled out with developers to understand why? I know there's been some financial disasters in between. But are you going to do any analysis to understand why they pulled out and how to prevent that in the future? What were they looking for that the city couldn't provide? Yeah, so a, a component of the plan is a feasibility analysis and, and talking directly to the developers, the ones that have, have had interest in the past and, and for whatever reason it didn't move forward, also ones that have interest now and, and what are those barriers. And as, as Jessica mentioned earlier, this expands beyond just the plan. So our, um, the city is really reaching out on kind of a multi-pronged approach, um, looking at, at what have been the, the barriers in the past. So re revisiting our, fees, our fee schedule, um, looking at the kind of the regulatory barriers, you know, how, how difficult is it to actually get a project approved? Um, what level of uncertainty is there in the development community? So we are trying to approach that from, from different angles and one of those would be through this plan and we are engaging in the outreach right now to try to look to the past and also look to, um, to future development. And I just have a more basic question. Um, 
What is the general vision for this plan in terms of its urban form? Are there any examples that, you know, I like what has happened in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I don't like what's happened in San Diego. I like what's happened in downtown Austin. Is that type of discussion happening or is it, or are we just talking about densities and height and? Right now we're talking about getting housing downtown. Um, how that looks is what this process is all about. So uh, we'd love to hear what you think the urban form should look like. Um, that's having the Cultural Heritage Board and Design Review Board as, as resources is very valuable. Um, but a part of this process would be to come up with that vision. And, um, and we'd, we'd also look at how our, our development standards reflect that. So um, we, we've, the, pre, the existing plan kind of dabbles in form-based code. It, it comes up with, with um, both hard and fast measurement development standards, but also um, development types. And what we've seen is that that can be a, a burden too, because if you wanna build something on a shop front street type, what are the different requirements that you need to do? And, and does that create all sorts of uncertainty? So we, we do wanna find what that vision is and we want this plan to reflect that urban form. So that's one of the reasons we're having this, this study session tonight. Thank you, but, but also just more basically, are there examples in other communities that you think may influence this because they have done it right within a cer certain um, perspective. So your question uh, resonates with the discussions we've been having as to how to most effectively engage the community. Certainly people should have the opportunity to consider land use distribution and look at downtown in two dimensions, but nobody visits downtown in two dimensions. Um, so we intend to engage people in um, sharing what kind of experience they would like downtown. And one of our challenges is to, you, to find the non-prejudicial examples. So you can't use different neighborhoods in San Francisco because they all mean different things to different people. And, but so we're looking for not a single form, but the, the range of possibilities um, that we can then share with people and get people's responses. What is the experience they want downtown, as well as where might they put what. And so really that we're exactly at that stage of looking for what is the right range, not which one is the right one. Right, because I think for many people this would be very abstract to talk about yeah. height and density. Yeah. And to use progressive examples, I think, without saying we're replicating this would be a good approach, because right. that for a lot of people, Right. That's going to be the vision yeah. they're going to respond to. Right. So you. we're looking like in the movies for those neighborhoods that you're like, oh, yeah, that's the kind of neighborhood I want, but you can't really tell where it is. Right? Right? right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Laura. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions that I have is whether the plan affects Santa Rosa Avenue, specifically on the east side of Santa Rosa Avenue, which is adjacent to the Burbank Gardens historic neighborhood, because on the map it kind of looks as though that area is on the east side of Santa Rosa Avenue is not um, a part of this plan. Yeah, all of the properties that front along Santa Rosa Avenue on the east side um, are within the plan area, and that is the only portions of the Burbank Gardens that are within the plan area. Okay. And then um, I, uh, who's going to choose the representatives, these six representatives that you're going to have for different neighborhoods? Because, you know, when we have these meetings, people that live in the historic neighborhoods are fiercely, fiercely, fiercely um, protective of their neighborhoods. And who's going to make the decision on who those six people that are going to represent a neighborhood are? And... Yeah, so um, I put this last slide up because this is the link to our, um, our current page. We're going to be um, having a standalone page to which is um, update downtown sr.com. Plan, <laughs> not even close. Plan downtown sr.com. Uh, but this this site this link will also work, um, and we have we're putting together an application right now for the community advisory committee. Um, in the next couple of days, that will be released, um, and then based on the responses to that, 
staff will be working to, with, uh, in concert with the planning staff and the uh, Office of Community Engagement will be working to put together that, that group. Um, but they will not be representatives or decision makers for those districts. Um, as I said before, they'll be ambassadors. So it's, it's one person whose name is on that list, but hopefully we'll have participation from, from many members of the group. They're, all the CAC meetings are public meetings. Um, so, so while one person might be on that, that committee, we'd want to get as get engagement and participation from as many people as we can. Okay, and then I want, uh, my last question is, is this plan related to the gateway plan that we talked about in 2007 and had public meetings and people talked about what they would like for that gateway from Highway 12 to Sonoma Avenue and what they wanted to see happen with bulb outs and limiting traffic in different directions and we had those meetings and it seems like this is kind of part of that but it's opened up and is something different but we called it the gate I think it was called like the gateway um, well we have the the Santa Rosa corridor plan the, the corridor plan yeah. that that was talked about with you know the areas fronting like Santa Rosa Avenue and what mm -hmm. you know people wanted are is that what this is based off of was that feedback that, that was that will be a part of 2007 yes yeah, so all of the specific plans um, and the visioning plans that have been done um, including like the Roseland plan recently the Santa Rosa corridor plan we have a Mendocino Avenue plan um, the bike and ped master plan there all the all the work that's gone into those and the public outreach we're not just putting that aside and then working on this plan they're all they'll all work in unison and then when we have a, a a newly adopted specific plan, they'll all be updated to be consistent. So they're they're all working together. They're not okay. singular entities. Thank you. All right. Um, I have a couple of questions and also comments, if that's appropriate. If you if some ideas about um, dealing with some of the issues that are might come up around historic resources. Um, I'm looking at page six of twenty four. So under task two where you specifically address historic resources. Um, and I applaud the idea of reconfirming the boundaries and of the existing historic districts. Um, you also say, I believe, sorry, uh, if GIS data is readily available, then you will produce a map that compares existing district boundaries with proposed adjustments, et cetera. I think one thing to make sure that you know, and I, I know you already do, but I want to say it out loud, our existing inventory has not been substantively updated since the mid-80s. And so you have a situation where people in all, with all good faith and intent have, have patched a few holes, but we have not done a citywide inventory in a long time. So working with existing records in the city is gonna replicate that gap unless you think about at least an initial um, update of the inventory, at least within the APE of this project. That would be an enormous service to this city um, and something that um, we do have pretty good GIS data available at the Northwest Information Center, which is one of the statewide systems uh, from the Chappaux's office, right? Um, our particular center has been out in front of the GIS conversion of all of the base maps for historic resources, prehistoric resources, um, historical archeology, span which would also be an interesting thing to include in this sensitivity map. When the smart train um, uh, redevelopment came through the railroad square area, they turned up significant archeological resources, including some really nice information on the um, cities, the impact of the 1906 earthquake to the city of Santa Rosa. It was a pretty radical um, event here. And that data is all sitting there in that area um, because that's where a lot of the clearance went when all the brick buildings downtown fell down. Um, they used the railroad to clear the material out. So um, those records are also available at the Northwest Information Center. So that's something to kind of put on your radar as a resource you might want to refer. You should talk perhaps to the director 
um, Brian Much, who once served on this board, so he's going to have an awareness of what your needs would be. Okay, that's a thought. Um, and don't forget to have a really good substantive discussion with staff here because they're well aware of the inventory problem um, and can help you with that. But pretty much none of that stuff on the west side of the freeway in any of those um, old industrial zones, they're not on the inventory. World War II is not on the inventory in this city. So much. And then last but not least, um, I noticed, and I don't have it up in front of me, but the, the flow chart of the time, if we could talk about that incredibly ambitious, yeah, um, this one takes my breath away, guys. This is, this is pretty intense. Um, I think everybody here is going to want to work with you to help you try and achieve this amazing goal. The one thing I'm noticing is that this is the last time you talk to us. This is the last conversation you're going to have with the Cultural Heritage Board and the Design Review Board about this. So that's, this is the last time as part of the consultant scope that we have a meeting with, with both of these boards. However, um, staff has been in discussion of we want to make sure that we continue to use these boards as uh, a, a valuable resource. So as part of our, our department reports, we will be incorporating it into the regular meetings of both of these boards. That's great. I was going to say, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater in the name of going fast because we can help with this. It's also the case that it, as, as the project is described, we start off consulting now, and then there's a whole lot of opportunity. We hope for the plan to change and evolve as it goes along. So we can start out talking to you about a plan that's about what kind of horse do you want to buy, and you could end up with rutabagas at the end. And I'd like to make sure that we get brought back in at some point to sort of comment on the root of Vegas as that's where you go, if you see my drift. Yeah, um, so in other words, I don't want to pass off on consulting now when the final product could be profoundly different from what we're hearing. Right, so. and, and so like in addition to what Patrick said, um, and bringing you updates on where we're at with the process, um, the other thing that we generally do um, is uh, at the end of the process when we have the draft specific plan, before we take it to the Planning Commission and Council for their consideration, we bring it to the Design Review Board and Cultural Heritage Board uh, to get your comments so that we can provide those to the Commission and Council. Awesome, that sounds fabulous. And if I could vote for this, I, I think that would be great if that could be a joint meeting again. I don't know about you folks, but I think we work pretty well together as a team that way. And it would, again, save you some time and get some synergy going with the conversation back and forth between your boards. Okay, that's all I've got. Thank you. I think we uh, welcome that opportunity if it works out for staff. Okay, uh, I would like to take this time to open up this item for public comment. Uh, I currently have one speaker card, but again, if you'd like to speak on this item, um, please, after uh, Mr. DeWitt is done with his three minutes, uh, go ahead and head up to the podium and just give me your name and comments. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dwayne. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I stayed because this is such an important matter. In two short months, you're already going to have a preferred plan according to that timeline. When you're from Roseland, you don't wear rose-colored glasses. You understand that things are going to be quite different than they're presented to you at various times. I've participated in almost every uh, planning activity that might have come Roseland's way for decades to try to be helpful to my community. I was at the Roseland Specific Plan as part of what they called a steering committee. Many of us called it a mushroom committee because we were kept in the dark about a lot of stuff. Anyway, at the time it seemed it was more about what staff wanted to do and they had gotten a grant and the director of planning at the time was getting a uh, bump in salary for a different position and spiking his pension and then leaving out. And that seemed a whole lot more important than what the community was bringing forward. And we actually appreciate Mr. Cancion, he's trying to do a job, but as so essentially, he has to do what staff says, and they're coming in with a preconceived notion of what they want, and it often is based on uh, erroneous 
pretensions and preconceived ideas of what's going to happen and how it should be. A perfect example during the specific plan is alternative transportation. We couldn't get the transportation and public works woman, Ms. Ede, on the same page with the parks woman, Ms. Santos, about a bike path that was supposed to be on the south side of Rosen Creek. They didn't even talk about it. And then at the end of the specific plan, we were told, oh, by the way, we're gonna advocate, not us, city staff, for a tunnel under Highway 12. It had not been discussed at all during the specific plan by the steering committee, I should say. Obviously, staff had been talking about it and things have been going on behind the scenes. So essentially what you have here is staff is gonna bring a project to you in two short months and say, this is our preferred plan and the folks out in the community agreed to it. I really beg to differ on that idea. It's gonna be the rubber stamp folks, the six people that they pick that they wanna be. Here's a better idea. Let the community pick the people they wanna be on involved with this. Let the community have a seat at the Technical Advisory Committee. We asked for that in the Rosen Pacific Plan. Ms. Jones wouldn't let that occur. So if you're not at the table, you're on the menu and you're gonna get chewed up. That's definitely how it happens. So, as you, I mean, look at that map up there. You can see what's gonna happen in just a few short months. It's almost over. We only have two weeks left in January. They're coming back to all alternatives in February. And then in March, preferred plan, boom, draft plan, environmental review, it's over. So we call that top down. And that's pretty much how this is gonna happen. I don't mind that if it's a good thing, but someone needs to show me how it's gonna be a good thing. As I hope some of you will remember there was a lawsuit about the Santa Rosa Avenue corridor and the gateways plan. There was a business association that came together and sued the city because of the way it was coming forward. I wasn't a part of that, but I kept those documents. And I think you folks should educate yourself because what you get from staff is usually what their view wants to be. You've gotta be your own best, uh, what's the term for that? A scholar, a student, a researcher of this stuff. You gotta know what's going on, otherwise they're gonna take you to the bank and laugh all the way. Because they already got the money from MTC, so you know, it doesn't really matter to them. It's really saddening to me because I've participated in so many of these things to try to be helpful and then find it didn't matter, that they were already gonna go ahead with what their preferred alternative was. In the case of the downtown people, it'll probably be business owners and landowners like Mr. Futrell, it would probably be the Chamber of Commerce, which has more strength than any citizens group, and then the Sonoma County Alliance. And those folks definitely pull far more strings than we mere peasants out in the community can. So keep all that in mind. I want you to do the best you can. And I'm looking forward to big, tall buildings down here. It could have been at the White House site already, which was already given essentially the get-go and didn't go anywhere because of financing. And the same with John Stewart's property at the Kennedy we walked by today. 15 years ago, that guy was ready to move forward. And what he told me was that a Santa Rosa mayor, a former mayor, got in the mix and cut that off. Not he, I should say, one of his workers that's down at UC Berkeley, and I think Mr. Canson would probably know him. But you, you understand this whole thing is about, you know, planning is politics. And the politics is those that got the dough, they're gonna make it go. The rest of us, we're just along for the ride. Maybe it'll be on the smart train, but we don't really know for sure. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Your comments are appreciated and duly noted. Okay, I've got another speaker card for a Thomas Ells. Thomas, microphone's all yours. I wanna thank you for having a joint board and please do continue to meet uh, together. There's so much that you can bring to the table together. Uh, I myself, uh, my background is anthropology. I'm an anthropologist and I'm a civil and environmental engineer. And um, to give you an idea, I was at Charles Kober and Associates and we did a lot of malls. We did a lot of other things, uh, including the Two Rock um, uh, uh, Enlisted Men's uh, uh, Barracks, which anyway, you know, 
It was a nice housing development out of Two Rock many, many years ago. It was one of the first things that they had that was sort of new. Uh, but we had Ron Altoon and Porter and, and John Jurdy were the main designers and then and many others. We were in association, if you will, uh, constantly in Los Angeles with Groon Associates and Frank Gehry was right there. So we were all in contact out. Point to Frank Gehry. Um, but just to remind you that I, I've been looking at South Park as, as this potential in South Park and, and I've seen that redevelopment uh, uh, design, meaning uh, it was intended to be a redevelopment area and it was from 1974. So it takes a long time like, like uh, Dwayne was saying. But I, I want to point out that, that Warren had some really important ideas about who could be partners. And those are really powerful. Uh, the, and the, while I would say the federal building and the state buildings, they've been weak partners to a certain extent. There were a lot of other, the fish and game was here. The, the um, um, I mean, the, you know, the federal fishing, state fishing game was here, but also um, um, uh, the oceans, I can't think of the name of their, they, they were here in these offices and you could meet with them and forestry and all the different people were here. Uh, you wanna get people like that back here, you know, the, it's too expensive for them to use San Francisco properties, as we know that PG&E may have to divest its property there, and get, I mean, it's very expensive there. And they'll be looking for places where people can can uh, be paid a little bit less and have a great, great life. That's here. Um, but as as Warren was mentioning, so there's other private developers, and and then it would go back to that question of the vision. What what is a vision? Now, the Southeast Greenway, that's really, fa that's a fabulous thing. It's gonna be like Central Park. It's gonna be like, um, it's gonna be like uh, San Francisco Golden Gate Park as a linear park. It's really connect to, to Trioni, Annadale. Um, that's gonna be fantastic. And I have proposed to the, there be artwork along there to be really, significant artwork along there too. Uh, public art that people will attract people, both bicycles and pedestrians and neighborhoods and everything in that in that area. And the, and the rest of it, somehow it has to connect. So from here to there, from here to the Southeast Greenway, you're gonna have to connect that. And along that, that, that should have definitely significant buildings just like you would have around Golden Gate Park or around, around Central Park. Um, but then it's gonna be, what's the there there? What's the there here? Um, and you talk about something 28 stories and I, it's, that's a jump to light speed. That's a jump to light speed, you know? And, and it looks great in the movie, but I don't know how you do it. And there's a question of conservation of mass. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, not on an actual 28 stories, but in going to light speed. Um, it would be like going to light speed for us here. And, and, and I would, it, not only that, is that, is that like with a navigation, an navigation easement around an airport is that around certain things, with an airport, airplanes coming in, you, you have a sloped, area away from, from that. And that could be like your main roads. You don't wanna have 28 stories right on the front line. So this needs to have a full conversation about the design issues and so on that, that will reflect on the city for a long time. A 28 story building that would be here, how long is that gonna be here? You, it's like look in, look in San Francisco and look how long those buildings are there, or even the buildings that are here, they can be here 100 years. And so please do, and I do again, thank you greatly for the beginning of this process, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ells, appreciate your participation. Any other public comment on this item? Seeing no one moving to the podium, I will close public comment on this item. Um, <clears throat> bringing it back to staff, I guess, before we go through and kind of give uh, final thoughts on the process, is there something that you want to hear from us tonight um, in specific terms or just general feedback at this point? 
both. So, <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, this is, um, as, as Vice Chair Purser said, you know, we'll be coming back later, but a lot of the plan will be developed at that point. So right now is the very beginning. We're laying out the scope um, and the vision. So if you have broad policy considerations or if you have specific details, we want to hear it all. Thanks. Okay, well, let's uh, go back through with some final thoughts. Sabra? Putting together the citizen group that will be giving you advice and helping with outreach will be extraordinarily sensitive. Uh, just as Mr. DeWitt mentioned that it's important that people who aren't generally seated at the table be part of the discussion, I think that I want to encourage you to look in unusual places to find your members. Um, most commonly, we go back to the people we know are reliable, that they'll show up at meetings, that they'll listen respectfully, um, and that's safe, but safe isn't always the best outcome, uh, especially for something where you're really trying to challenge the barriers that have kept us from moving forward. So I encourage you to look um, in organizations that are not the standard feeder organizations for the city, uh, to look at churches, to look at schools, to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, look beyond um, the people who are always civically engaged. Just as I mentioned that lots of people are not going to come to you, uh, it's going to be necessary for you to look at expanding the recruitment circle, particularly because of the aggressive schedule. Otherwise, there will be a lot of voices saying, why wasn't I consulted? You have to make certain that you have a chance to consult different voices. Thank you. Thank you, Sabra. Eric? Good luck on your journey, and I wish it as quickly as you target it. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Adam? Yeah, I think this is a, it's ambitious, definitely, and it's pretty exciting, also, what you're, you're hoping to do and planning to do. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, it's come up a number of times, it's just really echoing that, that concern about, you know, that an aggressive schedule is really exciting, but, you know, really keeping in mind um, of keeping those, the, the, those unconventional voices, like Sabre said, being, being incorporated, you know, there's always public processes where, you know, people, all of a sudden there's a final presentation, you know, this is gonna happen, you know, you know at the end of the summer, and people, there's gonna be, so huge segments of the community saying, I never heard about this. Um, so really thinking creatively about how to get that out there, especially with this really aggressive schedule. Um, you know, yeah, you know, the public relations getting, you know, media um, and really those unconventional um, um, engagements too. I mean, thinking about, you know, something that was uh, really interesting with Coffee Park recently and the actual city park that's going in there, there was, the engagement with the fourth grade classroom to come up with ideas of actually the, how the park was actually being built. Things like that where you actually get, you know, and those are really great things because you're engaging the next generation of stewards and, and planners, um, but you're also, you know, those are also really great things public relations wise because people like to see kids involved. And so if you get some coverage that way of really getting other people involved, um, you know, these hands-on things of, you know, you're having, you know, building components or models as part of the, the plan too, of something that people can physically see. You know, if you're going to events, um, especially downtown or other places that, you know, people can see it, that, you know, the maps are great, plan view is really interesting, but, you know, having, a, you know, a perspective view of really what a four-story versus a, you know, 18-story building is gonna look like or something like that. Um, and, and really also engaging of, um, you know, those really elemental things that people need in their daily lives, like, you know, you know, grocery stores, restrooms, things like that, you know, how, like, people, they come to downtown, they want to know, like, the, you know, like, one of the main things that people talk about is parking, like, if you're going to have all this new stuff downtown and new um, people living here and new businesses, where are people going to park, where, you know, like, just 
there's like the really elemental things that people are gonna wanna know about. And so keeping that in mind, because it seems to me with the aggressive schedule that it can, you know, kind of get bogged down in those nitty gritty. Like, is this a nitty gritty plan or is this like a dream plan? You know, it seems like to me like it's a little bit of both, which is great, but for the lay people, it's like it's hard to grab, wrap their heads around. So, um, yeah, I think just really keeping, you know, a, a really robust process um, while also really thinking about communicating it to the communities that we're serving both in downtown and citywide and outside. So, um, yeah, best of luck. And, you know, I definitely echo um, the idea of coming back to us too. And, you know, good to hear that, um, that there's the idea of um, scheduling another meeting with us because, you know, this is, this is great to give at the beginning of this process to give some ideas, but also as we see how it um, evolves through the process. I mean, that was one of my questions with lessons learned from the Roseland process. Um, it wasn't necessarily about learning about failures, but, you know, every time you do something, it kicks off more ideas of how you can get more people, more things like that. And so I'm certain we'll all go home and think of 15 other things. And so come back to us. We'll, we'll you know, probably have a really long meeting and, you know, give you way too much information, but thanks for listening. Thanks, uh, Adam and, and Warren. Can you comment on your 28-story building gonna, as a reference? Well, I just want to mention I was at 550 Mission Street in San Francisco. There's a new building that's 28 stories high. I was at the top floor at a, at a uh, wonderful event for foster children looking down the city. I think of the Richard Henry Dana in San Francisco was one of the best examples of green a, a grocer, uh, not, a, not a desert space, with about 20 stories of housing above it in the Barcadero. That's alive today, but that's a mixed-use building. I have a big flag about form-based code, and the word flexible with a big capital F is really important here because cities are dynamic. It's, it's the intersection of democracy and, and private capital. That's really, if you define a democracy, it is the it is the conversation and agreements between the private and public sector. So staying fluid, staying flexible with how these buildings may be. There may be one building that's all office, there may be one building that's all housing, but I would be very concerned if you flatlined that there be doorways every 30 feet with a pumpkin behind each door at Halloween. And um, it's, it's nonsense in a downtown where we, we, have, we have to have this, this partnership and, and thank, thank you again for considering re receiving the intellect of work and housing on this kind of a level. Um, in many small communities in the area like Windsor tried work live and they decided to sundown the whole operation because it, it just wasn't really efficacious. In an urban area like this, if you're gonna invest a Napa, did a CEQA downtown. They had big dollars and they paid for the entire CEQA process so developers could come in and not have to do traffic studies and sound studies. One of the unfortunate things is it all went hotel crazy and the hotels gobbled up all the parking stalls so they didn't get their housing. So the stewardship in the city is to try to create some level of um, governing um, order where, where this is a joint effort and the fight, as I understand it, is for housing. But, but these models, um, I'm, I'm fine with going vertical. It's a better, I'm on the board because I don't wanna see <clears throat> the environment squash too much, what's left of it, where, where the wild fox is in the, in the wilderness. I wanna see that not stepped on, so I'm big on big downtowns. But it's a capital serious venture. And when all that's said and done, it'd be great if it was a 40 year plan, it was durable, didn't sundown, and all that agreement was there so people could come in, breathe knowing that they wouldn't uh, be rejected. Thank you, Warren. Uh, I would agree with Warren and uh, that flexibility um, needs to be there. I mean, I think that um, we can have a vision and shape uh, this area as much as we want, but the reality is that economics are gonna prove out to dictate what gets built. Um, I did see in the plan that uh, there's gonna be a feasibility study uh, created to see kind of where the rents and cost of building, et cetera, kind of marry up and, and uh, meet 
to make it economically feasible to develop. And what I would recommend in that regard is that you get actual um, real world costs that you don't use some model from, you know, an insurance company or the Marshall Swift code plus the, you know, regional increases uh, that you talk to, you know, a Hugh Futrell or Rick Derringer and you, you know, these people are knowledgeable about what today's dollars will get you. Um, and the truth of the matter from what I understand is that, you know, as much as rents have increased and we've got a real housing shortage, it still isn't economically feasible for whatever reason to build, you know, above five stories. Maybe you gotta take a risk and get somebody to go 28. Um, I read an, a great article, um, if I can dig it up, I'll send it to you. It's called uh, Californians and their fear of heights. And it's all about tall buildings. Um, so I think we live in that world. Um, it's an interesting read of how we might uh, get around that and, and open up people's visions. Um, I also think that, you know, um, as people have mentioned, bringing uh, employment downtown might be the catalyst. Um, kind of some low hanging fruit that I was thinking about are the schools in the area. So, you know, why doesn't Sonoma State have their, you know, whatever urban planning they have in their school, why don't they have it at a campus downtown? Would make a whole lot more sense than at a you know, kind of sprawling area. Um, I know we used to have uh, UCSF um, grad school downtown. I'm not sure if it's still there, but just reinvigorating that, call it student base downtown, would, would reinvigorate some of the population and outdoor um, nightlife activities, I think. Um, I also think it's going to be critical to find a location for a grocery store, uh, more than just the corner market, but maybe not as large as, um, you know, the largest Oliver's around, but something comparable to a, you know, a nice higher end market that uh, you can grab your groceries every evening and walk um, to your house to get away from the, you know, the cars and, and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the Cultural Heritage Board. Thanks very much. All right, last comments for the moment, Anne? Yeah, I would like to see you folks come back to our group again and, you know, get reports on the various representatives of the Cultural Heritage Board and what they feel about the uptown downtown and how it will affect their communities. My input would be when you do your analysis, uh, when you look at successful urban blocks and form that you respect that along that corridor. Uh, my, my greatest fear is there would be sort of a, a piecemeal up and down development and you know, echoing at Warren said that's what happened when, when things sunset. Some towers go up and the rest remain flat. Um, I would also, be cautious of the transitions between the, that, that urban street wall and some of the better residential areas here. They go right against that. And it would be, uh, I think, unfortunate if there's really, again, abrupt changes in height. And then one thing that's really missing in downtown Santa Rosa, even though we had a representative from the museum, is culture. And if there were theaters or music halls or I don't know, it's something that be could incorporate into this to make it not only a, you know, a business sense kind of development, but one that makes Santa Rosa sort of a, a, a cultural attraction. Right now it's just a banking attraction, it's a shopping attraction, it's a beer market, but there's really no cultural magnet here. Thank you. Okay, I guess the one thing that I, one of the things I'd like to say is that I think that there's no bigger way to disenfranchise people than, than to not listen to what was said in meetings that were held in 2007 with neighbors and neighborhoods. And there was the gateway project that was specific from Highway 12's entrance into Santa Rosa going all the way to Sonoma, um, Sonoma Avenue. And it was, meetings were held, neighborhoods met, groups were you know advertised to come and meet and give your opinion and there's no bigger way to disenfranchise a group of people than it to all of a sudden this is not the gateway project this is this new plan and it seems like we're not paying attention to necessarily what that gateway project that spoke specifically of that area from 
Highway 12 as the gateway to Sono Sonoma Valley and Sonoma County. And, and we listened and we had meetings and we had um, lots and lots of people that came and gave their opinions and what they wanted to see. And um, it was kind of like said that this is the way it's gonna be and yeah, we're gonna stop traffic on one direction. And, and it seems like now this is part of this other plan that's now a bigger plan and, and we're forgetting about what was said in 2007 when this was all brought up. And I'd like to see, um, I think that if you talk about people feeling disenfranchised and feeling angry about what's going on and not wanting to involve themselves in you know, what, what's going on, it's to not listen and not to listen to what was said in 2007, even though it was 12 years ago, it's still important and it's still what people wanted at that time. And it was what the city kind of basically said we were gonna be doing and you know, the, the zoning was gonna reflect that and there were not gonna be any more car lots on, high, on Santa Rosa Avenue and there were lots of things that were promised and I'd like to make sure that even though this is part of this bigger plan now that we honor that gateway thing that we told people that we were gonna do back in 20, 2007 and I'd really like that to, to be respected and, and to remember that because that was real and that was a lot of people's time and it was, and if we aren't going to do it, then we're not gonna have people coming and showing up at community meetings and giving their opinions and saying what they think we should be doing. Because it was like I spent hours in 2007 and it's now you know, not happening. And I'd also like, especially with the six neighborhood districts, that the, um, the representatives that are chosen from those districts to work with the Cultural Heritage Board, um, whether you have a member of um, each of, of the members on the board represent a neighborhood so that they're working with um, you know, the member of the neighborhood that's chosen so that it can stay culturally relevant to what our board's vision is and not just somebody that maybe not understands, that doesn't understand the, the historic, you know, what, what we all work for as a board. So that would, that's all I have. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, all right, I'm, I'm gonna go at the historical perspective from a slightly different direction, and, and forgive me for taking the time, but um, I, th I think it might be interesting, anyway, to, to put a lot of this in a slightly different context. So I've been working on a project um, on the city of Santa Rosa and its development, especially of its neighborhoods, since 2014. Um, one of the things that I encounter over and over and over again is that when you say downtown, and I'm an anthropologist, so I, I don't say this is what the downtown is. I don't draw the line on the map. I let people draw it for me. When you say downtown to most people that I have talked to who are residents of Santa Rosa, they mean very much east of the freeway in this district and it's hard to overstate what a cognitive boundary that freeway is in this community. It's also a demographic boundary. Um, the census data maps from 2010 for the city of Santa Rosa are absolutely bifurcated. Um, you've worked the Roseland project, then you have some sense of this. If you look at the line on the map that you have drawn for this project, that's not the one that says downtown, but is the one that says specific plan area boundary. Can you pull that one up for me? See the black and the black dotted line? If this if staff has said several times that downtown is everybody's downtown, and I think I like that idea. I think there's some strength to that that in many ways grew out of our experience with the fire. And that square in particular became a place of performance of community identity. And I think that's a very powerful thing. But the line on your map has the potential for us to call downtown not only something that is much bigger than the current cognitive model of what's downtown, but is vastly more inclusive 
than the current notion of what's downtown, which is frankly dominated by the Chamber of Commerce and, and because it has very little residential sense, um, with the exception of these smaller historical districts. So in your choosing of where to target and who to go sit in their backyards, I would strongly suggest that you lean at least as heavily to the west of the freeway within that black line as you do to the east and as you do to the established historic districts. They already have lines on the map that define them as historic places. You will notice that it's kind of hard to find those on the west side of the freeway. You'll get told it's because there's nothing that's historical over there. I wouldn't do that with Dwayne DeWitt in the room, but, right? So I'm just looking at your map, and I would strongly encourage you to start calling that black line the new downtown and make it a little more inclusive. It's gonna make your job harder, but it's already your cotton pick and it's your boundary line, so you can go with it, right? It's a bigger downtown. My two cents. Okay, thank you. Um, any further comments from staff or needs or anything? We would just like to thank everyone for your time. And we would like to thank you for yours. And as Eric said, best of luck on this journey. <laughs> it's expeditious journey. So we'll uh, take a minute or so to change over to the new applicant of 7.2 and we'll move the meeting on.
keep balance of all of it. Kindly for open government. We're getting there. It's only been five years. <laughs> All right, so open government's out. But it's on the fast track now. <laughs> yeah, but it's right. right. All right, let's uh, begin to reconvene here. We lost our applicant here. Okay, we are moving on to item 7.2. This is the concept design review for Deterk Winery Village at 55 West 8th Street, file number DR18-085. And I will turn it over to Adam Ross for um, a staff report. Thank you, Chairman Kincaid uh, and members of the boards. Um, again, I'm Adam Ross, city planner here with the city of Santa Rosa. <laughs> Presenting before you Deterk Winery Village uh, for concept um, review, uh, located at 806 Donahue Street and 8 West 9th Street. 
So the project uh, involves an alteration to an approved 185 unit apartment complex that includes 15 very low income units. The project also includes the following changes. Um, so you re it's removing all of the residential units from the commercial building, uh, building C, uh, relocating those units to building B by adding a fourth floor to building B, and the addition of building E. The parking will re count rem will remain the same. Uh, the parking uh, will be at the floor level of building E uh, in the same configuration uh, as it was originally approved. Here's a project, uh, an outline of the property right here. It's within the West End Preservation District. Here's some images of the existing building on site. This is the uh, building C, the commercial building. We're currently uh, residential units uh, are proposed and approved but are being uh, relocated to building E, which is the new building, and the fourth floor at building B. General plan is transit village medium. It's within the downtown stationary specific plan. The zoning is transit village residential, which allows a density of 45 units per acre. So this was um, going back to an original proposal. The top uh, image shows what was originally proposed and then after uh, there were some comments and um, uh, suggestions made about the project. This is what it, uh, this is not the final approved but this uh, came back to you and the applicant has the images of what is finally, what was finalized and approved by city council and um, and, uh, and what uh, the project is going to look like after. So this is an overview of the previously approved project. Building E will be going right in this parking area. I believe this is building B. So the fourth floor will go onto building B. And this is uh, what is being proposed. So all the residential units are taken off of building C, relocated to building E, and a fourth floor on building B. So here are just some concept uh, 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 elevations for the project for building E. This is a uh, uh, building B, uh, uh, the approved version. As you can see, there's some residential uh, components up top right here. And this is the concept for the added fourth floor on building B. This is building C approved. And this is an approved building C. Um, this may not be completely accurate because the residential uh, units are actually not going to be there. The applicant has the latest um, version of this, uh, of this rendering, which you will see in their presentation. And that concludes staff's concept pre, uh, presentation for you. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. The applicant has a presentation of their own, and they are also here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, being this concept review, I think we'll hear the applicant's application and then open it up to any questions for either the applicant or the planners. With that, I'll hand it over to uh, Rick Derringer, applicant, and his architect, Mr. Kevin O'Malley. So working. Is that working? There we are. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Kincaid, Warren Hedgepath, Vice Chair, one of my favorite architects. Um, 
Marvia Purser, who is the Vice Chairman of Cultural Heritage and both the Design Review Board and the Cultural Heritage Board. Um, Dietrich Winery is the only housing project that has already been approved in the station area plan. It's 185 units. Uh, the council approved this, I believe it was in January of 2017. And after some, there were eight environmental groups that attended that meeting, including Greenpeace and a bunch of others uh, supporting the project. Um, and we got a unanimous vote of approval from the council. Uh, the reason we're here now is that after we started to go forward into construction, construction drawings, we ran into a problem because next to us is Pullman Loft. Pullman Loft ran into a problem because when they dug down into the ground for their garage or started to, they found problems that they didn't anticipate. So they came back to this group and uh, not cultural, but design review board and changed and moved their parking above because they couldn't go underground. We found a similar problem because at the time, the State Water Quality Control Board, who had given us a letter supporting the project and that we could do housing on the second floor and above, wound up closing out review of these types of projects and turned all that to the fire department. The fire department requested that we do an, a supplemental um, study, which we have here if you want to see it, that re basically came down to the fact that if we build within the brick building, we have to go down between four to s uh, 10 feet, uh, brace up the walls, get rid of all the concrete, get all the walls out of there, get rid of all the roofing material, find a way to brace the walls up during that period, and then move forward to build housing. That turned out to be close to an $800 to $1 million additional cost that we didn't know about. So what we did to deal with this issue, since our goal is still to build in 2019, because we're concerned that 2020 is a recession year, is we went back and said, what is the easiest way to build 185 units? And we met with staff, and we came up with a, a plan. That plan was to pull everything out of Building C out of the brick building so then we don't have to do all that work, move everything over to other buildings. And as long as we didn't change the 185, we didn't change the parking, we didn't change the elevation of any of the buildings on Donahue Street, then we were fine. So we created this new version. And Kevin O'Malley will go over the design elements, but the bottom line is the reason we're pushing to get this approved, hopefully by February, is that if we get by February, we can get the design review uh, designs done, we can get the engineering's done, which have already been started, and we can actually build this year. If not, we're in 2020, and we just don't know where 2020 is going to be, to be honest, because it, it, it in real estate, it doesn't look very good for the 2020 year. 2019 is looking good, but we wanna make sure we're building. And we'd be the first project built in the stationary plan, and we hope that will also encourage others to move forward. Um, so that's basically why we got to this point. Unfortunately, we didn't know about this issue until the fire department made a decision and gave us the criteria that they wanted. Um, so that's where we are. Now we'll show you through Kevin how we got to this level to fix the problem. Thank you. Just as a quick point of reference, uh, these were a couple images that were used in the original approval uh, back in 2017. Uh, there of, on the left, you've got building A, which is a view from uh, the corner of Donahue and West 8th, and then on the right, you've got a view of building D, which is the one to the north, and that's a view from uh, West 9th looking down Donahue.
So as Rick was mentioning, really we're here for about four things kind of resulting from wanting to move the, all the units out of building C. So the first item, oops, on that list, I'll go back. The first item was actually something we'd come, I think, back and uh, shown at a concept hearing, which was uh, parapet at the top of uh, building C at the southwest corner. I'll jump to that slide real quick. Right there, whoops. Okay, the uh, left side of this image is building C. Um, and I think we had an older image that uh, Adam had shown that showed the original parapet or what currently exists. And there's a desire to extend that parapet and kind of clean it up. And, and this was one of those images that we came back with at a previous concept hearing showing that revised parapet condition. So that, that's one of our, our first modification. And the second, here's building B that I think Adam had the image of also. So originally we had this approved for three stories, which I think is our next slide or that slide. That was this three, three story version. And in order to move some of the units out of building C, we increased this building to four stories uh, and actually converted them to flat. So we have units on a single unit on every floor now. Uh, previously, we had some townhouse units in here, so uh, by going to the four stories and going flats, we put a bunch of those units that were in C into this building. Those were just some little 3D concepts of that. And then uh, third modification was the addition of building C, and this is similar image that you just saw, shows a glimpse between building uh, C on your left and building A on your right, and in the background is building E. This is a driveway from uh, Donahue Street that really is an exit, entrance and exit from uh, building C for parking. And then this was a quick image just showing some of the materials. We're trying to use the same language of materials that we used on the previously approved buildings. So we have the metal panels at the top floor. We made a slight adjustment on this one to try to open it up. Uh, building A had um, balconies that, on the, especially on the third or the fourth floor that were solid. So we're trying to emphasize the three-story height. We opened these up to rail railings since it's more of an enclosed interior courtyard area. So try to be a little more open. Um, we've got uh, the hardy panel siding, same material we're using on the front buildings. Uh, for the rest of the materials, industrial windows and, and uh, doors. And there was some representative views of that. It's a little hard to make good views of this building because it's kind of whoops, sandwiched in between other buildings. And then we had a couple other items. These were just the floor plans, concept floor plans of the units in building E. And then we had a, one other item that we added, uh, some adjustment to building A, the, the north and south facades of building A uh, never really got adjusted when we adjusted the Donahue side um, and, and made this, the fourth floor decks have a solid wall for their uh, decks, trying to emphasize that four or three story um, level of the building. And so we kind of went back and looked at that concept and wrapped what we were doing on the west side of building A and brought it around both the north end and south end, which would, the south end would be facing uh, West 8th Street and tried to get rid of, rid of a lot of the glass because also our, our primary, um, that's not really our primary entrance that it kind of looks like it, uh, but really that's an exit stair, that main central volume. So we kind of brought the brick massing down uh, and simplify the window so we didn't have as much glass going in into an exit stair corridor. So that's what we're proposing on south of building A. 
and then similar on the north side of building A, simplifying those volumes, trying to emphasize more of a three-story uh, massing with the brick and de-emphasize the four-story height. So that was kind of, the, that was the fourth item we added. And there's quick little renderings of uh, West 8th and Donahue Corner. So the top image is of the, what is currently approved. The bottom image is what we're proposing. Hmm. Let me go back just so you can understand here too, to the plan views of the buildings. Okay, so. Okay, there we got the pointer. So really, we're not changing anything in building D up here as from what was previously approved. And mostly the inside of building C was parking previously and we're still keeping it parking. We're trying to keep the front of the building on Donahue here and here where kind of our lobby area is. We're trying to keep that animated and not shove all the parking to the front of the building. Try to keep most of it towards the back. And then this is building E right here that got added in. It wasn't in the previous proposal. We've got parking towards the back of it and units across the front. And building B, the primary change was adding the fourth floor, but in doing that, we internalized the circulation. Uh, we had some exterior doors and because we had uh, ground floor units and then an entrance to a second and third floor unit, we internalized the circulation now. So there's basically just windows uh, facing the exterior, circulation is on the interior of the building now. And moving to the second level, you can kind of see the differences on the bottom. This was the approved project, so we had some units in building C right here on the north end, and those are now removed here. And we have building E added here, which was not in the original proposal here. basically translates to the third floor also. There again, units were here in building C. We removed them from the building now. We've added them, added units to building E here. And, oops. No. And then here's the fourth floor. So again, removing these units out. So we have no units at all in building C and then here's the units in building E, and now we have a fourth floor also on uh, building B, which did not exist down here previously. So I think those are the gist of our changes uh, in order to allow us to move the units out of building C, and we're here as a concept to bring it before you and get uh, feedback so that we can come back for a final meeting. Okay, um, I think before we bring it back to the boards, um, I will take public comment on this item. All right, so public comment uh, for item 7.2, concept review for Deterrick Winery Village. Mr. Dwayne DeWitt. There. Dwayne DeWitt, I'm from Roseland. I'm a member of the Sonoma County Housing Advocacy Group. I have no financial interest or ties to this gentleman or this project. I'm here to advocate that this project be allowed to go forward as soon as possible. It's been waiting. There's been difficulties that I'm sure um, were unforeseen, but it's really important we get these housing units as soon as possible. And I'm hoping that you folks will Take it upon yourselves to say, okay, there have been some changes, but it's not taking away from the general concept that had already been approved in the past. So please say, go forward, sir, and bring the housing to our community. The sooner he gets it done, the better off the members of the Sonoma County Housing Advocacy Group will be feeling. Thank you. Thank you, Duane. Any other members of the public wishing to comment on this item? 
All right, seeing no one address the podium, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board. Um, so this time, uh, let's go with questions for the applicant or the um, staff. Saber. I have only one question. Can you help me see where the affordable units will be? Are they mixed in or are they focused in and localized? Originally approved as a mix um, throughout the project. And you've maintained that? Yeah, we haven't changed that part of it at all. Excellent, thank you. Eric? Sorry, I wasn't part of the original board when when this was brought forward before. For the commercial space, what what kind of commercial use is it? Is it business, retail, combination? Right now, if you've been to the building, we just opened up a criminal bakery and coffee shop, which is jammed all the time with neighbors. Um, that will stay there. We have a 20,000 square foot gym. Most of that will stay there because the gym is good for the residential people. Uh, we have an approval for a public market that we can put in the building if we have enough square footage. We think we will, but part of this is going to be on uh, designing it and make sure it all fits in. But we already have the gym, we have the coffee shop, we have the bakery, and we have a lot of nutrition tenants in the building now that blend in with the cafe. And there's 25,000 square feet that was originally approved. Yep. Nope. The heating and air conditioning units, are those roof mount, are those going to be on the roof? I don't see those in the diagrams at all. Um, most of the, I think we have a second floor, well, I know we have a second floor podium, and most of the units are going to be mounted at the back side of the units there, the small split system units. So when you say on the back side, you're, you're saying the track side? Correct. Yeah. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Adam. Thanks. <clears throat> um, and again, yeah, same with Eric. This predates uh, me on the board. It's started today. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I also agree with Mr. DeWitt that uh, it would be great to get that housing there. Um, and I would encourage also the finding that square footage for a, a market. Um, that neighborhood, you know, has a really vibrant. Um, local community. It's great that Criminal moved over there. Um, it's an amazing um, coffee shop and bakery, but having something else as, you know, a, a quality market in that area would be great. Um, also, um, and again, you're not really uh, adding any, trying to muddy the water on the design, but um, having the entrances and, and, and having right now, it's a, it's a big brick wall. Um, having that interface with the park and the, the Turk round barn that's there. Um, another element of the neighborhood also is they used to have the um, West End Farmer's Market there, moved over to Railroad Square. But I would hope so, yeah, I've heard that. Um, because, and I think that, that that's an opportunity there with the cafe and a market, the dog run, the, the park, of making this to, to not be just a, a wall and a wall sort of blocking the train also, um, but to have it be engaged with the community to permeate that wall a little bit too. And, and from what I'm seeing, it, it does that. Um, but I, I, um, there is a, somewhat of an element of, of keeping that facade there um, and really increasing that permeability and having it be part of the, the park and the, the neighborhood feel. But um, yeah, let's get more housing there. Thank you. Warren. Yeah, thank you for um, probably the uh, one of the, the longest running events here, I'm, and I'm um, I'm just reflecting on a couple things. Um, I appreciate the the conversations around 
some of the geology, the soils, the, the issues you ran to with fire. So my understanding is that Building C, what once was a building we were going to have units facing this, this wall, we're going to retire the idea of housing being there and generally in the central part of the area, all the built up roofs from 1921, 1882 are going to stay. On the parking, with the advent of this new building, um, the building um, that is now going to be uh, locating the parking, the daylight parking that, that was in the south there, we know there's a grade change. We, we have BKF had, had, it shows about a seven foot difference between the buildings built in the 1800s and the, the, uh, your most northerly building. And so maybe I'm, I'm gonna ask the architect, Kevin, in your kind work, are you gonna try to, the, the parking that was displaced in the new building, that parking is gonna be relocated so you have a net no, no loss in parking is, is there a ramp or some excise where that parking is still inside the, the original building or where, where did that parking go? You're talking about the parking that was, that's in building C that was there previously, the main building? Yeah, the, the parking that was in building C, we, right. we have our, our newest addition and that's a garden, those, those are units that are from ground up, you're not parking, you, you can see from the, that's right. the, the, the very slide you have up now, the, that humanity is at the ground floor in Correct. that back building. So the, the cars that were once there where humanity now is, where did they reappear? Well, there's some of them in the back of building E, and I think we did add some to building C. Let's go back to that slide. So there's some at the back of building E here okay. still. And then I think we did, I'll have to look, we did, I think, sh shrink at the front what we previously had for commercial. There was a little more commercial here. We think we picked up a row, another, another row of parking here. I see. So if you move your cursor just a little over um, to the, the north there, where we had the, the wall condition before, you know, move, it, move it down to the lower part of the screen, right in there, right, right in that zone. Mm -hmm. So. My question there is the elevation which the cars are parked. Is that the same elevation as the parking to the far north? Or what is, um, I'm, I'm just wondering, those stalls that are there, they're underneath the old existing roof. Right. Are they are they gonna populate the old floor line, the, the fill floor line from 1880? Well, it, it, no, it's not. It, yeah, the, you mean the this part of the building, right? here that's under the, it's in building C. Yes. Correct. Yes. We've got new floor out here. This is all new building. And then we're gonna have to get into this floor here. But I only remember about, I think 18 inches of grade change we had okay. across all these units. That's its concept. I hadn't seen the section. I'm just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My, my question was, you're gonna be able to keep building C, the integrity of the roof and the structure as its old bones still live you'll be able to park that, but not have the building have illness to it. That, that's the intent is that we don't get into building C and tear out floors and mm -hmm. rebuild the whole inside of that building, that we use what's there for parking. Okay, that Correct. was the question. That was a great question, because I had a similar one. Um, so for the exterior of, um, where's my notes? of building C, does that get preservation work? What happens to the exterior? I, I don't recall what was happening to it before and now that we're keeping the roof, et cetera, et cetera. What is there? Well, now that? once the rain stops, we go back to finishing it up. You see, we've only done probably at most 40, a uh, quarter of it. We still have to go around to do the rest of it. And that is the plan. I still probably would like to take the part of the front of the building that is not um, historic, the um, the block building mm -hmm. portion, the add-on. I'd like to, t even though that's showing still there, we probably like to come and take that off because it's just an old add-on uh, situation. We, th we, we would normally do that ourselves with permits unless the design review board wants us to bring it back later to show what it looks like. But once we take that block off, we're back to the original building. Mm -hmm. 
which I would think everybody, including cultural, would, would rather. I mean, that's what they asked us to do in the initial hearings, get rid of the block. Right. That's uh, our intent. And this is a question uh, probably for staff and the applicant, but um, you have an approved plan. You're creating a new building. Why are we back at concept versus re-looking at final? Is it just too big of a change or what's the thought process? I, I understand that if none of this gets approved that you can still go back and build the other project. I get that piece of it. So is there any other reason why we're back at concept? So it's it's my understanding that it is a, a big enough change to warrant the the uh, entitlement of design review and cultural heritage, um, uh, major cultural heritage. Uh, I'm sorry, major landmark alteration is the correct term, and a uh, major design review. So the concept is to get your comments, of course, you, um, and in take those into consideration and come back for the final. But yes, the. Overall, the project is large enough in scope to warrant that with the uh, addition of Building E. And um, I believe even the even if it was just the fourth story, that, that could also trigger that as well. And in understanding that, and this is more for the new members on the board or those who haven't been in the room before for this, this concept review while the applicant is talking about the changes in general opens up a full design review. It's not, nothing's locked in and set in stone right now, correct? Correct. Thank you, no further questions. All right, thank you. Um, questions for either staff or the folks bringing the proposal? You're gonna pass, okay. Sir? Um, I hate to be the wet blanket, but when this came before the first, before the joint board in November 3, 2016, there was a question as to which buildings were recognized as eligible for the California Register and were therefore subject to CEQA. And we never had a uh, participate, or I, would, I don't think we ever saw this again. And so our feeling at the time was we punted on that because if one of those were, and uh, what we saw in 2016 tonight, they would not make the Secretary of Interior's standards for rehabilitation. So I guess my question is, what was the resolve of that? I mean, there's a little bit of that discussion in Ms. Painter's um, cover letter, but I'm still unclear which particular buildings have been formally determined eligible, and are they coming formally under CEQA as part of this re revigored process? Uh, going back to the hearing, you weren't there. Um, Design Review Board approved the project, but it was cultural heritage that wouldn't approve it for one reason, that they didn't like the fact that under state law, you had no say on the fourth floor. They were, the chair, chairwoman was upset about the fact that Cultural Heritage Board doesn't have a say on the fourth floor because that's state law. And then less, Cultural could provide uh, something that showed there was an adverse impact, which they didn't. Um, that's why I went to council and council reviewed it and said there is no adverse impact we're approving it and the design was fine. The issue we have is the majority of what's being done on the front of Donia, which is the primary building under, under state law. We're not making any changes. The elevations are not being changed. The secondary wall, which are the side walls, we're only making changes on building E to the back of the building mm -hmm. where somebody at one time for some reason was able to get the city to approve five roll-up doors and took all the windows out, the round windows out of that section. So the building E will come up to that. But it was stated by um, our historian and cultural heritage at the time said, well, we recognize that's kind of like was ripped apart at one time so we can live with that. The other thing on building B, which is the side of building B, mm -hmm. the Cultural Heritage Board 
supported putting windows and doors in that building because it wasn't facing Donahue. You don't even see Donahue Street, even though it's original building from the 18-something. I don't know if that answers it, but... Well, I guess this is more of a question to staff because we came to a very clear impasse about whether the building was subject to CEQA, and if it was, what was proposed would not make the Secretary of Interior standards. I, I don't know what you're referring to, the chair, I don't remember that, but I just remember all of us were in consensus that we didn't have enough information, if, and if it was indeed eligible for the California State Register, what was being proposed um, did not meet all the requirements that were applicable under the Secretary of Interior State. Right, standards. however, when yes. you went to hearing in front of the council, your chairwoman appeared mm -hmm. and stated in, in su basic support of what we were doing, and the council vote said that they could not reach a point where there's an adverse impact, because that's the only way right. the Cultural Heritage Board can stop a project, is by saying here is the identifiable um, adverse impacts. I, I think I think we're, mis we're we're talking across purposes here. Can staff please clar clarify is this building on the California list or not? Or formally determined? Or yeah, has it, has that determination been made? That's all we're asking. So I don't I don't know that uh, at this time. I can follow up with you after this meeting. Um, but what I can say about CEQA is that the project was reviewed against CEQA and um, was deemed appropriate at that time. Um, and again, I could follow up with. What time was that? January. So for the, it was okay. approved by city council okay. in January of 2017. Okay. Well, I just want to be clear where this particular board was on November 3rd, 2016. And I understand it was appealed, um, but at least from my perspective, we're kind of back where we were in 2016. I don't have the information. Can I jump in here real quick? Yeah. And I would wholeheartedly agree with you. That was part of my question of now we're back to concept review. So, you know, reset the wheel. I think this, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think this board's going to come to the same exact conclusion and you're going to have to appeal this to council again. So, I mean, that's, am I wrong to, to get past this impasse if it exists still? So um, if I could just um, say a few words here. So again, we, as you mentioned, we are at concept review right now. Uh, the next step in this process will be to come to both boards for um, the project proposal uh, with its entitlements. At that time, additional environmental analysis will need to be done on the proposed additions. Um, and so that will be before you and you'll be able to consider that and act on it at that time. Um, and then anything beyond that, you know, it could be, any action can be appealed to the city council. Yeah, and let me say, the project's been approved, and it was approved over the Cultural Heritage Board. No disrespect to the Cultural Heritage Board, the council said we need housing, and we don't agree with you. I am looking at an issue here, it's really simple for me. If we have to put housing and spend a million dollars in Building C, we are now a commercial property with no housing ever. I have no choice. I can't put it in there. So you have to make a determination what's more important for the community and the city because we're actually taking units off of Building C, the ones that were there, and removing them. And that went up 48 feet. Now that's coming off of this design and we're just moving forward on the two other, the only, two of the buildings are actually went through last concept hearing. Two of those items were the parapet and the fourth floor in building uh, it, B were looked at. It's the new building and the changes Kevin wants on the side, which we're just asking if you think it looks better, because I think it does look better, but it's up to you. You could say no, leave it alone. But if I can't get those building out of, those housing units out of building, um, uh, see, there is no more project ever. I, I appreciate that, but I'm just saying, this particular body last saw this proposal November 3rd, 2016. We didn't have accurate information at that time. It sounds like we don't have it tonight. 
from what we understood was proposed, if it was eligible under CEQA for review, it wouldn't make it. Um, well, you were. I go to you, if you're the council, it was, that issue was raised in front of the council. Right. And the council said, with their lawyer there, city council attorney, that the decision on dealing with that issue relates to adverse impact and we did not, we could not raise adverse impact because under state law, that is the only issue involved. But again. I, I, yeah, let me, let me jump yeah. in here again, sorry. I think that from a concept is a design review and cultural heritage board meeting that the point is well taken, that there's a stumbling block ahead for this project in this board and then if we can just if you have more questions, okay. we'll go with more questions, and then if we can get on to kind of commenting on the changes, that would be great. Yes, and, and staff is hearing the concerns and the uh, information that is uh, going to be necessary to consider this project, and so again, this is concept design review. Uh, we will have all of that uh, detailed information for you as well as background information from previous um, proposals and approvals uh, when you see this in its final form. Okay. Given that, um, Kevin, could you just go over what has changed with the uh, historic building using the elevations and conceptuals, please? I think the principal concern was from the west elevation at the time. Oh. Are we, have we changed anything in building? See, see? We have, under this new revised, we haven't changed, uh, we're back to building C being exactly the what it is today. There's no housing in there. So in theory, we're not making any modifications to the brick building except for except for what was asked us to do, which is clean up the brick. So there, there's n in the brick building, the entire brick building, nothing changes. I, I th I'm gonna step in for a second, just, just a second. I think part of the confusion is that when you look at Diana Painter's report, there is an item there in her extended description. There's change one is the parapet. Change two says the addition of a fourth story on building C. It, and, and it goes into great detail about adding a fourth story. And I think that's, a, that's where some of the confusion is coming from here. Yeah. It's, that addition is not listed in your material, but it is in hers, and this is the document that we need to pay attention to. Yeah, let me explain so. why that happened, and that is our fault. Uh, her report's being split up now. Um, there is no buildings, no housing, no fourth floor in the brick building. The reason she said the fourth floor in building C in that report is because at the time that she wrote the report, we were anticipating going forward and building 200 and some, uni uh, 200 and some units. Actually, if you went to the, cult to the concept hearing that we went to in August, that showed 240 units and that would have created more housing in Building C. Subsequent to that, because the report that was written by the, the, by the soil people came in after that situation, it was determined we're not gonna put any housing in that. The only way we could ever put housing in B Building C at all is if I were to get another 100 units there so that I could spend the extra million dollars to go down. And that's not contemplated under this approval. No, thank you, I think we understand but there, that part. But that is that's incorrect, useful. and I was gonna have her re, re, redo that report to take that out. I was gonna out. say, for staff, we probably need a revision of that report to make sure that, that there's no confusion going forward. I wanna let my other, I, oh, I, you, you get another? Yeah, no? Okay. So I. I I was going off that report, and that caused great confusion. So, Kevin, could you just walk us through what's happening to each elevation, if anything, along Building C? That's that's all I, I want to hear. And if it's nothing, that's. Mm. 
primarily nothing on Donahue. Uh, we do have a, you can see we have a stair core right here, stair and elevator core, and it's gonna come out and we're gonna have one small man door opening, maybe a double door coming out here. Um, nothing on the rest of this facade until we deal with commercial, uh, you know, but there's, in, there's existing entrances there. And then we've got building uh, E going up against the building and then we have, st we're still keeping an exit out of this parking right here that was a roll up door. That's it. I'd like to say with that information, I feel much more comfortable about your <laughs> proposal. Thank you. You sure? All right. Um, I, uh, now that we've cleared up the, the mystery fourth floor on building C, I think I will forbear to ask questions at this time. Okay. Um, comments on the changes to design? Sabra? I'll defer to later. Um, I'm, I'm okay with the um, moving the units, adding the additional building. Uh, what I don't like is the um, metal siding that's on the fourth floor for those buildings. Uh, looking at the conceptual design photos, uh, no offense, but it looks like cargo containers on the fourth floor. Um, I think I, an easy fix for that would be to change that to uh, the smooth hardy panel siding that we see on building A. Uh, D and E have the metal siding that I couldn't see. I, I didn't make note about the other, the other buildings that have it. I believe it's building B. I think it would look much better with the smooth hardy panel siding uh, like it does on building A but the rest of the changes I'm okay with. Uh, and I know that you had approval for the metal siding before, so uh, unfortunately I wasn't here for that. Are you recommending the third and fourth as a hardy rather than any metal? Take the metal on the third floor off? Which is? I didn't see on the is there any? third floor which no, building. No, never mind, there isn't any on it, so that making the fourth floor hardy is fine. Correct, to match the other. Right, that's fine. Thank you. Adam? Um, just a, a couple of questions in the exterior of the building um, and uh, the streetscape that's on there. Um, I'm seeing uh, are the, uh, on the architectural site plan A1.1C, the green trees that are there, are those existing um, trees or are those proposed trees and are the dotted circles existing or proposed. I'm kind of curious about what you're actually doing. Yes. The green ones in the front were already approved. Okay. Uh -huh. And they are trees, I just. Oh, they, okay. Again, that, that predates me, so I'm kind of trying to wrap right. my head what should, the thinking of, this is going towards more thinking about the streetscaping there. So. Well, one thing I'm looking at and it's something I'm hoping we can do through staff rather than go through a hearing again, is the four trees that are in the cutout area. We'd like to make that more of a park looking area. Of the uh, small courtyard there? Yeah, because, so are we on the, yeah, there? because it faces the round barn and faces the park there. And we think it'd be nice, even though you have to walk to it from the apartments, I think it's much nicer, surely much nicer than looking at careful moving trucks but we want to go and and up and and make that a little bit. And our landscape people are are going to send something back for review. We may even have that for the next hearing. Okay, I'd be interested in seeing that. Yeah, because I'm. I was. My next question was going around the whole building. The dotted circles are those proposed trees? Or are those kind of placeholders there? You talk. Are we? Yeah, I'm not certain. If we're on you're talking about the trees on Donahue. So if I if I move this, you're talking about these little round circles here. Uh, yes. Yeah, they are and trees. Going around. They are trees, Proposed. correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so my question also then going um, towards uh, 
materials for that courtyard area. Um, there's one, and it might just be kind of placeholder image. Um, you know, are you thinking concrete courtyard, thinking anything permeable? I mean, sort of material-wise, you know, I appreciate all of the work that's gone on the building envelope, but for the actual, you know, your, like I was saying before, across the street from the park, how is that being integrated and softened from just industrial building to mm -hmm. permeable streetscape? Yes, uh, we, we'll bring that to the next hearing, but essentially similar to what we had approved last time, we had seating out there, we had some raised planter areas, so we had softened that whole entry area to make it you know, more inviting, more of an entry recess into the building. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring that forward with more detail last from. So that that's a, will be addressed in the next correct. round. Okay. And it's also important to understand behind that entry area is the entrance there's another entrance there and a whole garden area that's going to be inside the building. Yeah. And that's all going to be part of what you'll see as far as the inside outside park area. Okay. Because we'd like to create a lot more than what's there. Sure. Yeah, and uh, well, I think it would be hard to get less. But um I'm at least at that area, but uh um yeah, I would I would I'd, I'd be interested in in the next round to see choice of materials, choice of permeable you know, if that comes in terms of like paving, planters, ha some ways to break it up so it's not solid. Um, and that, that could help um, address the, the facade of the, the building that's, that's there as well. You know, more trees, but just thinking about, you know, cutouts. Well, you know, I'm also interested in stormwater and things like that. So what's, what's happening with that? And I look forward to the next round. Thank you. Horn. Um, thank you. I, I do lament that early on, you know, back in the 2014 cycle, had a sales report been done, you probably wouldn't even be here, you'd be built maybe, I'm not sure, but there's a lot of other issues. But I, I want to um, counter one thing delicately on Eric. What I like about the project now is that there is this block of history in the middle. In flanking it with the new architecture, I actually love the color shift of the fourth floor. Now you can, you can take hardy plank and go vertical and paint it if, if there's a question about metal, but I'm not opposed to the metal. I really think that one of the, the more thrilling things now in the project, and Kevin, you're, you're nodding your head as well, it has this kind of a flight feeling that the, the A buildings, the E building, I love the fact that there's no arches in the stucco. And going back to history in the old buildings after they're all sandblasted, hopefully the coning, the brick won't fall out, but the old building has its history. It's, it's a novel written, it's Cervantes, Don Quixote, it's, it's there. That's the hope, is, is that that novel stays. The new novels that are written on each end, um, I, I love the, uh, the balconies and the canopies that are shown, and I, I think it's clever that you're using a, a red plaster um, with the grays and, and the black windows, but I'm, I'm for one, thinking now that the project has a freshness to it and energy because of the elevations, it, it preserves potentially, I'll say this, it preserves history more if you can keep that roof on. And I know there's still cars driving around somewhere down there, but um, I would not simulate floor three with floor four. I would let floor four have its own music like, like you're doing with its, um, it just, there's a lightness to that. and. I know that you can be successful in, in painted cementitious and you know, metal is also quite crisp and wonderful too. But I think my overarching concerns in the past about livability in building C, this is the ninth time maybe I've said this, you're, you're liberating yourself from caged canaries now being inside that building. The birds are free to fly now and you've, you've put them now in bird talk at each end. So I know there's other things to talk about, and it's, it's nice, uh, Adam, you've, you've spoken about landscaping. There are a lot of issues around how to, how to interface. I'm not sure how staff, when it comes to the pedestrian nature, the, the train now, and how the commercial square footage plays out. Some of the buildings have dog food in them, and, and they've got storage. If they're animated more, I'll just leave it to staff. As you look at your report at how, um, how those buildings are now occupied by humanity that's not housing. Um, my understanding is that we're, we're okay with this horse trade of parking stalls and that um, 
that's been vetted in, in the tables. I would expect, seeing this again in a more formal level, we would see the doorbell count and the parking count and whatever the ratio is, 1.5 or 1.12 stalls, that those stalls are there. Um, to Sabra's point about allocating housing units, at least the, the table, the conditions of staff are that X, whether it's 15% or whatever, but the, the conditions of approval are that X number of affordable units are there. And with the parking ratios and the X units of affordability and the fact that it's in this station zone where the, the height of the building potentially is uh, tolerable at four stories, um, I can't speak in behalf of both boards, but I love the idea of generally history being less touched, less fussed with, more asleep, restful, but not dead with new donuts. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Um, I'll keep it simple. Uh, I agree with Warren. Um, I think, <clears throat> you know, kind of celebrate the industrial look. I know. Um, what Eric's talking about in the rendering, it looks a little bit containerish, but I think that as it is built, it won't look that way. Um, and my only comment or question, um, and it can be addressed at the next uh, meeting, is the color. I, for some reason, I remember it being a darker metal for, than what's being shown here. It's kind of like a lighter gray in, in the renderings right now. And so I'm just, I'd prefer to see it be a little more dark because then I think it gets away from that cartoonish um, more container more and gun more metal and gunmetal, yeah, than, than kind of grayed out. Um, so that would kind of be the only comment. Um, it's just in some of the photos, it looks a little bit lighter. Like the um, A-7.8.2 um, is the render, is the, rendering shown in an actual photograph. So it's probably just a depiction of the different colors. But anyways, I'd prefer to see a darker color on that fourth floor. Scott, if you look at A16A, I'm in the wrong package. <laughs> uh, shows building D at Donahue at 9th. Let's see. Which one was I on? Now I lost it. Building E. Uh, I think it was the previously approved. Yeah, it's the oh, previously, previously approved, approved set. Okay. Set. That's, that's why. Yeah. Which attachment is that? I'm sorry. Now I lost it. Uh, okay. Approved plans. All right. There we go. In 10, 12, 16? Uh, it's a reduced attachment three, approved plans, and it was A1. Yeah, so A1, 6A. I'm getting There's there. a picture yep. with the darker yeah. gray, so maybe if that metal siding matched that darker gray trim. Yeah, I mean, even the the siding in this picture looks darker than in the picture I was looking at. So as long as it's darker in nature, I think it, it would play better with the brick and the colors and no arches. No arches. Is, is there a comment on on the fourth change, which is the side of building Ninth Street and A Street, as far as the, what Kevin was proposing? It, it, it's the one that shows his change to building. Uh, a and the building D on the, or building A on both sides. Do you have that one? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, okay. The one that has the, this, the, the two, uh, one is up top, one's down below, shows the original proposed building right. uh, A, and then below it, I think, or above it, one or the other, it shows what Kevin's asking for uh, to change it. I just want to get a comment if you like the change he's making. I'm trying to find it in my plan set here. <laughs> it's on this one. You can just look right here. This is it. A one. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You're talking about the okay. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. I w thought that it looked more handsome and simpler. So that's 
my oh, answer that's to all that. I mean, ever, anybody else want to comment? But on the, that he's taking it and wrapping it around except for all the glazing that was originally there? You're talking about the, the metal on the roof? No. Remember the two, um, I don't think we, I don't know that we have your presentation in our package here. You're talking about the column of the windows? Yes. Yeah, and all the glass. All the glass and, now it's and no the, glass. the stairwell. Oh yes, it was all the glass, and now it's. You, you want the more, so, the, the most recent, more subdued look. Correct. So, so their proposal is your green light. What did everybody else think of that? I liked it a lot better. Yeah, I think those of us who were on the board before. Yeah. But we 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 saw it, we remember it, and and the new the new um, look is more serene, tasteful, and healthy. All right. All right. Okay. On to you. Cultural Heritage Board, any final comments? No? Nope. No from Ann, John. If you're going along with the metal, what how would it be treated? On the upper floor. It was a pre painted finish metal. Okay. I think it was the darker color. I don't know why the renderings were. I just were... remember yeah. what it was. Okay. All right. Is that all? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it might help staff. Um, there is a reference specifically in uh, Diana Painter's report. Um, it's the first paragraph under background. It'll help you in your quest for the information we're looking for. The last couple of sentences, the intensive level survey that accompanied the proposed development found the complex individually eligible for listing in the National Register by survey evaluation as well as being eligible as a contributor to a National Register district. Therefore, the building complex is considered a histor historic resource for purposes of CEQA. But she clarifies that down in the footnotes, and this might actually sort of be the beginning of your, your thread to where to find this info. Note that the building complex is a contributor to a local district, not a National Register district, as the building was never ultimately put forward for the National Register nomination. Nonetheless, a contributor to a local district that is recognized by the state, as this one is, is considered a historic resources for purposes of CEQA. And that's the clarification we're looking for. So check in with any of us and we can help more. Okay? Okay. I think with that, we're done. So. Do, do you have the reference, may I ask, that where you complained about the fourth floor wording that confused you on B Building C? Can I just get the reference on what that is so we it can check it? It is on page 4 of 12 of her report. It is, she has a very nice section where she itemized one, change number two, change number three, and change number four. Here's change. This is the criteria by which She's evaluating whether these changes are problematic or not. The addition, the change number two is specifically stipulated as the addition of a fourth story on building C. That's the one you probably want to strike. Right, we'll strike that out because we're not going at this time into that level. We, we may in the future, but we're just not there. Thanks. Okay, with comments complete from both boards on this concept review, um, we will move on to item number eight, board member reports. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you all. We'll see, we'll see you. We'll look forward to it. Uh, board member reports, any from design review? you have any board rem member reports from Cultural Heritage Board? No reports. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to department reports. 
Uh, yes, thank you. So I just wanted to let uh, both the boards know that the uh, city council uh, last week approved a uh, ordinance change to the city's density bonus ordinance. Uh, they had a second reading this week and that ordinance will go into effect um, in about 31 days. Uh, the changes were primarily to address changes in state law, uh, but we also have a new provision for what, what's called supplemental density bonus, which would allow um, to properties to go up to uh, possible 100% density bonus in certain areas of the city. And those areas are focused around uh, the downtown stationary specific plan and the North Santa Rosa stationary specific plan around that Northern smart station. Um, the, uh, the changes uh, were directed uh, by council through the housing action plan. Um, uh, the plan with staff, these projects, um, similarly the, the Deterk project had a density bonus um, that came before you. Um, so it is likely that you will at some point see a project that could potentially be utilizing that supplemental density bonus beyond what is allowed by the state. Uh, we wanna give you an opportunity to hear from staff about what that um, ordinance involves um, and help us help you to understand what it means before you see a project. So because of its complication, uh, we don't wanna bring that before you until we know that a project is coming before you. Uh, so the plan is to, once we know a project um, is proposed that will come before one or both boards, uh, we will schedule a study session with you to go over the proposed ordinance and all of its intricacies and answer any questions that you might have. That's all. Thank you. Any uh, questions from the staff report? Seeing none. Um, <clears throat> so on my adjournment uh, item number 10 i've got the that we're going to take a dinner break um and so i'm wondering yeah you want to take a short one i was just going to pull the six minutes, six, six minutes. <laughs> okay 15 minutes and meanwhile i need to adjourn the cultural heritage board because we will not be rejoining you um we're going to head out right Okay, so, well, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure as always. As Thank always, you, Vice Chair Purser and uh, members and of with the you folks. Cultural Heritage Board. Um, good luck with your evening. Thank you. So we will adjourn this meeting for 15 minutes and we will reconvene the Design Review Board.
I'd like to call to order the <clears throat> regular meeting of the Design Review Board for the City of Santa Rosa, January 17th, 2019. Uh, I wanted to take a minute before we move on to roll call to thank uh, both applicants, members of the public, and staff for their patience while we grabbed a quick bite to eat. Uh, we've been at it since 2.30, some of us a little bit earlier, so we appreciate uh, getting some sustenance to continue on this evening. Um, so thank you. Uh, with that, Patty, can I have a roll call, please? Okay. Let the record reflect that all board members are present except for board members Weigel and Zuko. Thank you. And moving on to item number two, approval of the minutes. Item 2.1 are minutes from January 3rd, 2019. Does anybody have any comments? Sabra. So sorry. I have no comment. I was going to move to approve. Any comments on uh, changes to the minutes? Hearing none. Oh, go ahead. Eric. I might, because when last time I looked at the minutes, it didn't have any minutes in it. Um, so maybe it's an updated version. Sorry. So there were none of none of the board member comments at all or anything is like that in the minutes that I have. Is that correct? This is for item 6.1, which was preliminary and final design for the Piner Road Assisted Living Residence. Yeah, so approval of minutes for 2.1, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, which was January 3rd. I see that um, in the draft minutes, yes, I don't see any um, comments. That yeah, um, we're having some problems with Legistar, so um, I'll call the city clerk tomorrow and get some help with that to get the condition put in the minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, with uh, notating that we're uh, going to add the comments into the minutes, we'll leave it at that. Great. Okay, uh, we have board business. Um, <clears throat> since some of you weren't here earlier, I uh, welcomed a new board member. Uh, first meeting today, Adam Sharon. So welcome again. This is back to a regular meeting instead of a joint meeting. So you see how this rolls. Uh, but welcome again. Um, and uh, with the appointment of myself as chairperson of the board, uh, we also need to appoint a vice chair. Um, and so we can either, I, I had it put on the agenda so that it was an option to discuss tonight, but we can certainly uh, table it for the next meeting and hope that we might have uh, both Drew and Kevin here with us. So what does everybody think? Are you looking for a motion for the vice chair or just or a discussion? Or a decision to punt until next uh, meeting, hoping that we have a full quorum. Um, I'd make a motion to nominate Warren Hedgepath as vice chair. Warren, would you entertain continuing on as vice chair of the design review board? Yes, I'm grateful to be alive. And while I'm still alive, I would do so. Thank you. So, so I've got a motion from Eric and the acceptance to continue on as vice chair. Do I have a second? Sabra, second? I second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Patty, can I get a roll call? Okay, board members, Breer? Yes. Goldschlag? Aye. Hedgepeth? Aye. Kincaid? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Thank you. Cleaned up board business. Very nice, Eric. Then thank you, Warren, for continuing on as vice chair. You can you can sit at my right <laughs> for the time being. You did such a good job before. So. They will. <clears throat> Okay, um, this is where I read the statement of purpose. Uh, the review authority shall consider the location, design, site plan configuration, and the overall effect of the proposed project upon surrounding properties and the city in general. Review shall be conducted by comparing the proposed project to the general plan, any applicable specific plan, applicable zoning code standards and requirements, 
consistency of the project with the city's design guidelines, architectural criteria for special areas, and other applicable city requirements. That is the direction of this board. At this time, I would like to open up public comment on any items that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, those that are on the agenda, uh, we will have public comment during those agendized items. Seeing no one approaching the microphone, I will close public comment. Item number five, statements of abstention by board members. Do we have any abstentions for tonight's item 6.1 or 6.2? Seeing none, we will move on to our first scheduled item, item 6.1, which is a continued public hearing, Community Baptist Church Faux Steeple and Building Mounted Minor Telecommunication Facility Design Review Minor at 1620 Sonoma Avenue, file number DR18005. And I will turn it over to Andrew for a staff report. Great, thank you, Chair Kincaid, and good evening, members of the uh, Design Review Board. Uh, this evening's um, public hearing is a continued public hearing. The item was first presented to uh, Design Review Board on December 6, 2018. In advance of this evening's meeting, um, I did prepare a summary memo that described um, the board's recommendations on the project as it was previously presented, as well as revisions to the project um, that were submitted by the applicant. Included in that memo were attachments um, two, which was the revised plan set dated October 14, 2019, uh, the revised photo simulations dated uh, January 14, 2019, and then uh, yesterday distributed via email was uh, the revised project narrative um, dated January 16, 2019. And additionally, um, I did uh, give to Patty this evening a, a letter that was received later this afternoon from the property owner um, expressing the uh, property owner's support for the revisions to the proposed design. So with that in mind, I'd like to quickly um, go through the presentation that was given on December 6th to familiarize, refamiliarize everybody with the project and then move forward to the revisions uh, as presented by the applicant. So it's minor design review for a full <coughs> steeple. The uh, project that was reviewed um, included a 54 foot tall structure with a 12 by 12 foot building footprint, as well as a ground lease area located to the rear of the property. Uh, the design element for review on that component was the six foot tall composite wood privacy fence around the perimeter. Uh, the reason it was elevated to design review board for uh, design review is because uh, the neighborhood had indicated that the um, design was a component that was particularly important to them, as well as the fact that both the design guidelines and the zoning code uh, lack defined standards for a steeple tower structure. Um, and the authority is given to the director to elevate uh, projects as appropriate or as he uh, deems necessary. The uh, project location is on Sonoma Avenue in northeastern Santa Rosa. And um, there we see it's a specific location situated well within um, otherwise uh, low density residential development. And uh, here are some photos. The upper photo shows uh, the church structure and property from Sonoma Avenue. Uh, lower left hand corner, we see the rear of the church structure where the proposed steeple tower would be located. And finally, the rear of the property, um, back about 30 feet from the top of uh, Spring Creek, where the uh, 225 square foot ground lease area would be located. The project history is quite lengthy. We've been working on this project uh, since it was submitted in January 16, 2018. It has held a neighborhood meeting. Um, Waterways Advisory Committee has reviewed the uh, application, and uh, we are on our third shot clock extension. Following the uh, Jan December 6 Design Review Board meeting, uh, the applicant and the city did agree to a uh, shot clock time extension, extending the project deadline to January 30th, 2019. So if uh, the project is approved at this evening's meeting with a 10-day appeal period, um, the the applicant would receive final approvals by January 30th. Uh, with regard to the continued public hearing, um, the, the project was continued to a date certain of December 20th, 2018, 
Uh, then at the December 20th meeting, Design Review Board continued it to a date uncertain because the applicant had not prepared revisions at that point in time. Um, we did uh, then require a re-noticing because it was continued to a date uncertain. Public hearing notices were distributed on December 31st, 2018. That included um, a notice for publication in the Press Democrat. There was an issue with uh, another public hearing notice that was due to be published on the same day. That public hearing notice, it was requested that the notice be pulled. Press Democrat inadvertently pulled the wrong notice and pulled the public notice that was to be um, advertised for this public hearing. Uh, we reviewed it with the city attorney. The city ad attorney determined that that error in noticing, um, because there were three other methods of noticing, um, could be allowed in the public hearing, could be held this evening. Uh, I would like to note here that there have been no public comments in response to the noticing uh, for this public hearing. So the zoning is R2 within a uh, Majority of the area is owned R16. I did want to show this slide to point out that the zoning administrator had approved the minor conditional use permit for the minor telecommunications facility use um, on December 6th. Um, there were no appeals filed for that approval, and so uh, that minor conditional use permit for the, the uh, use has been approved. The proposed site plan shows the location of the uh, proposed steeple tower um, as well as the ground lease area. And we look at the project details as they were originally uh, presented. I'd like to point out on this slide that the, the uh, maximum height of the proposed tower is 54 feet as compared to the uh, 23 feet for the top of the existing building. Again, another perspective uh, of the uh, tower height. And then we have some photo simulations that show what was proposed. We see that it's a 54-foot uh, a, uh, tall tower with solid surfaces embellished with the um, religious cross. This is a perspective uh, from the rear of the parcel or looking towards the front. And then finally, another perspective from Sonoma Avenue. There were no openings in the uh, proposed uh, tower and um, the tower footprint again was 12 foot by 12 foot, comprised of all um, same material, which was an RF um, radio frequency type of fiberglass material that allows transmission of, of radio frequency waves. The ancillary equipment area is located at least 30 feet from the setback of the uh, Spring Creek top of bank. And we can see here, this is the um, proposed six foot tall a wood composite fence, solid fence. And then this is if uh, the design review, review board was to approve this but desired for all um, equipment within the ground lease area to be screened, then um, the applicant could add two feet of lattice on top of that six foot tall solid fence. Um, the design review board did not weigh in on a decision on the screening, so we would ask that you do review and um, consider that this evening as well. So the issues, uh, the proposed steeple height, the original proposal was for 62 feet with an eight foot square footprint. Uh, during um, planning review, that was revised by the applicant to 54 feet tall with a 12 foot square footprint. Um, that was uh, in consideration of the neighborhood's um, primary complaint about the design as it related to the height. There are no um, building height limits related uh, to towers, gables, spires, or similar structures. Other objections related to the proposed use of the land, and then an um, objection to the design and location of the uh, proposed faux steeple, including why it's needed, again, the height, and uh, the suggestion that it could be moved to the rear or the side of the church building. I believe in the uh, December 6th presentation, it was indicated that um, part of the location of the structure is the applicant's no negotiations with the property owner, and the property owner prefers the location where it's currently proposed. So um, the uh, design review board members on December 6th voted to continue the public hearing, encouraged the applicant to consider redesigning the steeple with a smaller footprint including materials authentic to the church at the lower level of the steeple using real materials, adding some detail and variation, and then um, as well as including some, some openings in the um, surface planes of the uh, 
steeple tower walls. There were some sketches, conceptual sketches that were provided to the applicant following the meeting. And so the applicant prepared this following study based upon those sketches. The sketches featured horizontal bands creating some openness in the, um, the tower. And we can see that here. And then the applicant, after, after studying those recommendations, um, responded by reducing the structure footprint from a 12 by 12 foot footprint to nine by nine foot footprint, which is what they're currently proposing. They are in fact going to design vertical openings on all of the surface planes. We'll see that in just a moment with a, a, some space separating the top of the structure wall and the roof. And they are going to diversify materials to include metal grill works uh, within those openings. These are the, um, so we see here the uh, photo simulations provided by the applicant showing the um, opening at the top of the structure. The cross um, feature which was added and is flush mounted on the structure, the applicant did study that but concluded that using the RF material uh, that it didn't need to be flush mounted for safety and security purposes. Um, then we see the vertical openings with the screening elements. And another view, I would like to note that at the, at the bottom, the openings at the ground level, uh, we did talk to the applicant about those openings and the applicant has revised that design to um, extend those openings to currently about six feet tall at the ground level. And then finally, another view from um, Sonoma Avenue again. So here's the proposed redesign in the, um, the schematic. We can see that the ground opening is uh, six feet tall, six feet wide. Um, those would be metal or aluminum grills, which would provide security to keep people from entering into the tower. But it would also provide sufficient space for um, maintenance upon the antennas in, located inside the tower, whether that's standard maintenance or uh, changing out those antennas at some point in time, it would facilitate that. Uh, what this, while this does show the proposed openings in the tower, it does not show uh, the grill work that would be proposed to be placed within those openings. And then here's another perspective from the side of the tower, again reflecting the, uh, the openings um, as well as the, the area, the open area between the top of the wall and the roof, but not reflecting the uh, religious cross. The project as uh, revised um, is still exempt from CEQA, subject to section 15301, class one exemption for existing facilities. Uh, section 15303, a class three exemption for new construction or conversion of small structures. And uh, finally, section 15300.2, the exceptions for um, historic resources uh, was found to be um, not applicable because the, the site is not recommended eligible for the National Register of Historic Properties or the California Register of Historic Properties. Again, no additional comments were received in response to a notice of continued public hearing dated December 31st, 2018. Uh, it is recommended by Planning and Economic Development Department that the Design Review Board approve minor design review for the faux steeple and screening of the ancillary equipment area proposed in conjunction with the building mounted minor telecommunications facility. And uh, staff is available to answer any questions. The applicant is here this evening. Uh, the applicant does not have a presentation but is prepared to answer questions. Thank you. Andrew, thank you. That was a very complete and thorough uh, recap and uh, proposed project um, design. So uh, with that, Sabra, any questions for staff? The one thing I didn't find was what the materials were at ground level and how those compared to the request for real materials similar to those used on the main building. I would defer that question to applicant. I think they are prepared to answer that question. Yeah, why don't you come down and that way we can handle whatever questions would be best answered by you.
Jerry Johnson on behalf of applicant Verizon um, Wireless. So the underlying structure would be a steel um, support structure and then it would be either wood or stucco and that would be um, at the uh, board's uh, discretion. So uh, either wood or stucco. And, and the material used on the main structure of the church? The uh, church structure is brick and based on comments we received from um, the design review board, it was recommended that we not use brick for the faux steeple. Okay, thank you. Eric? Um, two, two questions. To confirm the fence, there were, the plan for the fence is six feet with two feet of lattice on top of that, eight feet total? Or for the, the fence around the equipment, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. So the applicant had proposed a six foot uh, solid um, composite wood fence. Um, if we look at, if we look here, we can see that there is still some equipment that appears um, might rise above the, uh, the extent of that fence. So um, it is in a residential zoning district and in residential zoning districts, uh, fence six feet tall solid with two feet of lattice would be um, permitted by right. And so the applicant has agreed that if it is the preference of the design review board um, to add two feet of lattice to the top of that six foot solid fence to ensure that all equipment is screened. Thank you. And then the second question, uh, the rendering photos, so there's no longer a cross on the steeple? There, if you'll notice in the photo that I presented this evening, there is a cross. I believe in the um, photo simulations that you received via Legistar or Legi I legislate, whatever the service <laughs> is, <laughs> that, uh, that you're correct that those photo simulations did not reflect the cross. Um, they have been updated to reflect the cross as you see here. So there will, there will be a cross on, the, on it then? There will Confirming. be. Confirming, okay. Yes. Those were my two questions, thank you. Adam. Yes, thanks. <clears throat> uh, on the plans, uh, well, first of all, um, I would definitely um, encourage a two feet of lattice in case any um, equipment pokes its, its head over the top there. Um, uh, on the plans A3.1, um, I, I don't see it called out that the screening uh, on the ground is repeated in the center portion of the um, the openings, but it does in the the rendering. So there is it, will the screening match, or is it going to be open in those? We would recommend screening on those openings to prevent debris or animals from being able to enter the structure. Mm -hmm. That that would I would also agree with that <laughs> recommendation. Okay. Um, it just because that's not um, uh, drawn in here on the on the, the plans. Um, okay, um, thank you for answering that. Thank you, Warren. Yeah, thank you. Um, similar to Adams, so I know that in screening McNichols, there's a lot of different companies that have perforated screen, and then there's woven screen. But somehow you'll, it, I, I like what I see in the. The, the general appearance that to, to keep birds and debris out, there's some relative, it's transparent, but it's it's something pre-manufactured. It's not wood lattice, it's metal. And that same would go to the, the ground as well. So at the six foot level, at the ground level, and up the, the tower proper, you'd have the same material. If that's the board's preference, we had um, thought about at the ground level adding something that was a little bit more decorative, um, that was a little bit more solid um, because the ground level could possibly be accessed by the public. We would want something that was a little bit, um, would prohibit people from being able to access um, at the ground level, but also allow um, service technicians to be able to access the structure. Okay, that's, that's understood. The other kind question was um, the the stucco is uh, a reassuring choice, I think, because the the simulated engineered brick. When when you build the structure, it's typically going to be a maybe a wheeling metal stud. Maybe it's a two by six, two by eight, and 
the return when you have these openings in it. The, the question is, um, when you drive by this, you're gonna see the thickness of the wall and the stucco would return back in the jams and the, excuse me, the, the stucco that you see in the face, there would be a return of that material. It's almost like a, a, a window opening, so to speak. But the, the actual plastering of the inside of that opening as it turns, to, it returns back, head jam sill. Do you understand that question? You're talking about being able to see one side from a different perspective? Yeah, you, you, you building this thing out of metal studs, it's gonna be plastered on the face. When you have an opening, the thickness of the stud, you would return back and cover that thickness of the, of the metal member with plaster as well. Correct. Yes. Correct. And I, I know that the, the colors on the church prop, it's kind of a chocolate brown roof um, between the eave and the, and the gable. The question about that same chocolate color, right now you have silver, it looks like just a silver, but there, there's a question about whether the bars, the, the metal flutes, mm -hmm. what color they are, the, the top of the, the canopy or the tower, excuse me, the question about whether that would want to match like the chocolate eave line of the church. Maybe that was just a, the rendering didn't color it, but that was a question. Yeah, Andrew and I actually talked about that top, uh, that top hat and that kind of off-white um, color there. And so we are open to, um, you know, making the color scheme consistent if that's, if that's necessary. Okay. Yeah, Would that look nicer? Yes. Thank you, Warren. Um, can I ask how you feel about the lattice in the uh, equipment area? Over, uh, over the fence, six foot fence, two foot lattice. I'm not uh, really disturbed by it. I think the, the lattice would help. I mean, I, I love seeing plants grow and cover the whole thing. It'd be nice to just be a green box with ficus on it, but there's maintenance there. But yeah, if we could screen material so that uh, it wouldn't bruise the eye, is that it? Great, thank you. And I don't have any questions for the applicant or staff. Um, so at this time, I would like to open the meeting for a public comment. Um, I see someone headed up to the podium, so if you can just give us your name and then uh, take your three minutes or so to tell us about your thoughts on the project. Okay, Wes Daniels. <clears throat> Excuse me, I own, the, uh, I own the house directly across the street. Um, I, was very, I was very upset with the bulk of the, uh, the, the 12 by 12 proposal when we, we went to the public meeting and it was 8 by 8. It's, it's better now, but it should still be eight by eight. Nine by nine is 40% more area. And, and uh, the, the public weighed in on the basis, on, on the understanding that it would be eight by eight and, and, and it wouldn't balloon out to 12 by 12. And, and, uh, and, and I think that the bulk and the aspect ratio, I wouldn't mind it was a little taller, but, but I think that the, the aspect ratio is better at eight feet and the bulk is better at eight feet. At, at 12 feet, it looked like a, a high rise with no windows and, um, and, and I think this is very sensitive to slenderness. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Any other members of the public wishing to comment on item 6.1? Seeing none, I will close the public comment on this item and bring the attention back to the board for comments. Um, before we do comments, if there's a, a motion to consider, um, that would be fantastic. I'll, uh, I'll make my attempt. Uh, make a motion to uh, approve the Community Baptist Church Faux Staple and Building Mounted Minor Telecommunication Facility uh, at 1620 Sonoma Avenue, which would be file number DR18-005, and also appro approve as proposed, including the six-foot fencing with the two-foot lattice uh, topping on that. Thank you. 
second. Okay, now we'll have discussion. Sabre, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I, first, I'd like the petitioner to correct me if I misremember something. So, as I recall, you can't make this tower taller than 54 feet. Um, we reduced the height as a direct response to um, neighborhood concerns regarding the height. Um, also, the CUP has determined that the height is um, 54. So um, 54 feet is um, the desired height, um, and that is in direct response to uh, the concerns of the neighborhood. That's what I recalled. I also recalled that because you had a height constraint, you also had a um, dimension constraint, that you, you could reduce the footprint and would be working to reduce it as far as you could, but you weren't certain you could go back to eight foot by eight foot. Is that correct? Correct, there are technical constraints and um, nine feet by nine f feet is um, the smallest we can get. Um, the structure with me here tonight is the radio frequency engineer from Verizon and he can speak to um, those limitations regarding the width of the steeple and, and why we need the nine feet by nine feet and it's so that the antennas can be configured correctly. Thank you, that's my only uh comment on, uh, or only set of questions on that. Um, I'm delighted you were able to reduce the footprint. I think the design looks a good deal more modern. Yeah, it's, it's in keeping with the sense of the church, but it's not mimicking uh, a 1960s design, which I also appreciate. Uh, I'm not certain I understand why there are openings at the ground floor, but that's just a quibble that I don't need to understand that architecturally to say that this looks good and seems to be uh, consonant with the original church building. So thank you for that. A quick note, the, the opening at the bottom is to allow um, service technicians to access the the steeple for routine maintenance and upgrades, so it allows them to be able to get up into the structure. Oh, I understood that okay. there was an access door. Okay. I just didn't exactly understand why that access door was grill work instead of a uh, panel. Okay. Eric? Um, I do think the, the redesign looks much better, uh, and I appreciate it, and I commend the applicant for trying to meet as many needs as possible of the, the residents um, and doing the best they can to, again, listen to the time, the review board, listen to the residents, lower the tower, shrink the footprint. Uh, and um, I think it's, um, you were successful in trying to accomplish the best you can, uh, the, the input that, that you received, so I appreciate you. So uh, appreciate that, and I appreciate the the residents' input. I'm I'm glad to see you and hear you as well. So thank you. Thanks, Eric. Adam. Uh, yes. Um, to piggyback on what Sabre was saying about the uh, access at the bottom, um, just do, does there need to be access on all four sides? No. So if, if the board thinks that it would look better to have um, some of those openings closed off and just leave access for the service technician, that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, from my standpoint, I wasn't here for the um, initial discussion in December. Um, uh, I appreciate reducing the mass of the, the structure with the openings in, um, on the, in the center portion, um, but from from my preference would be to have a more of a sturdy pedestal look because to make make the the tower not look you know like it's going to tip over or blow over but to give it a sturdier bottom so okay. um i would prefer to have it be enclosed okay. um, i appreciate some discussion amongst okay. other board members but um and and also i mean that's just sort of aesthetic and the weight of the structure but uh also, the material of having an open screening down at the bottom invites, you know, um, 
children cr climbing on it. Um, okay. Ac uh, it, there's access um, and safety concerns, but there's also just, you know, general um, people kind of messing with it. And the, if it's a wall, it's okay. not necessarily there, and it looks sturdier and more solid, so. Okay, thank you. Oh, and one other, uh, to, uh, to, to go with the, the stucco and, and matching the, um, the, the facade of the church as much as possible, too. Okay. And the colors on top. So. Okay. Uh, before I leave you, Adam, do you have a preference on where the opening is? Would you want it on the east side of the steeple so it's facing interior to the existing buildings and then you would want the solid walls on the facing the street and then facing, um, I guess it's south? Uh, I would say, because it looks like there's an entrance on the Backside. Um, oh well, um, the f I would imagine that the opening would be on the wall facing the wall of the church. I say it as much as possible. So solid walls around, and then that's one side. So yeah, I'm, north, yeah, I'm not sure where. So I, I don't think, know if there's room there, yeah. but we can yeah, get to that. Yeah, if, in a if there's access. If possible, then we would you would want to retain the six by six opening on the east wall of the steeple tower. And then the southwest and north elevations would be solid down to ground level. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Warren. Yeah. I, again, I appreciate all that's been said. I um, matching the matching the colors of the the silver back down to the chocolate brown. I think a a charcoal gray for the screen would be great. M my thought on the on the base is if it's solid. I. I guess I, I rather like the idea of at least one like the uh, the west side, which is accessible. If that was black or charcoal doors, um, I, I kind of think it's it's uplifting and fun to have a void there because it strengthens the the columns. That was my thought. I was trying to make it lighter. I'm not. I don't want to get fussy here, overly granular. But there was a, a sense of of lightness to the structure that uh, was poetic in my opinion, but it's only one opinion in a democracy. Thanks, Warren. Um, to your comment on the um, details, were you saying that this should be, those ribs should be like a dark brown to chocolate? To okay, match they're, the trim color. They're just gonna stand out. Okay. Nothing else is, is silver anymore. Okay, and then the charcoal gray for the screening. Yeah, and maybe the door is below too. And maybe the door is below, okay. Um, I wanna commend the applicant um, for making the changes. I think that uh, you took what the board had to say and, and really made it happen, um, both in you know shrinking down the size of the footprint and opening it up so that it kind of feels airy and, and less of a pencil look, um, I'm still a huge proponent personally of just having a metal um, pole, not in that location, but <laughs> I think I can go with it based on the majority of the board here. Um, so I want to recap what I've heard so far as conditions um, of the approval. Um, shall provide two foot lattice on top of the six foot fence at the mechanical yard. That was in the motion. I'll just leave it as a condition as well. Um, trim at the top of the steeple shall match the color of the trim on the existing church. Um, steeple shall be solid on three sides, or do we decide two sides? Three? I like two. Anybody? Preference? Shall be solid on three sides? We're doing democracy. My preference is three. I agree with Adam. And Sabre is holding up a three, so... Um, We'll go with democracy voting rules and uh, we'll call it shall be solid on yeah. three sides. And so that would put opening at the east side facing the um, existing building. Opening at the east side. Facing. And you're talking about an access door, exactly. correct? Yep. Not a screen. And just for clarification, you're talking about solid on the base of the structure? Yes, steeple shall be solid on three sides at base of structure. Okay. 
with opening at the east side facing the existing building. Real quick on that. Yep. When it rains, all that rain's gonna pop up on all the stucco, but if there was, I wish there was planting along it, it would soften, your, your maintenance on your stucco would go way down, but if there's a little ring like a foot of grass or something there because you're gonna have a uh, discolored future. Do you wanna make that a uh, consider or do you wanna just, okay. Consider perimeter landscape uh, buffer surround. And then um, consider charcoal gray for screen and doors. Hmm. Any other uh, thoughts? Chairman, mean, just, just yeah. for clarification, we've, I've heard that the door, the access door is on the east side, and I've also heard that it's on next to the church, but the church is to the north of the tower, so. Yeah, there's a little wing that pops out of the yeah. existing buildings to the east, but just looking at the plan view, I don't know that there's gonna be room for doors to open Correct. out. Okay, yeah. I just wanna make sure that yeah. we were clear. Yep, thank you for that clarification. Um, and then, okay. And then we wanted the um, accent um, vertical elements to match the existing trim color of the church. Okay, so one more time through. I have shall provide two foot lattice on top of six foot fence at mechanical yard. Trim at the top of the steeple shall match the color of the trim on the existing church. Steeple shall be solid three sides at the base of the structure with opening at the east side facing the existing building. Consider perimeter landscape buffer surround. Consider charcoal gray for the screens and doors. And then the accent vertical elements to match the existing trim color of the church. And to make that happen, we need a friendly amendment to the motion, which was made by Eric and seconded by Sabra. So I'd Warren? like to make a friendly motion approving said conditions and suggestions as noted in waive reading of the text. Uh, does the motioner accept the friendly amendment? I do, yes. And the second accept? Any questions from the applicant or staff on this condition and motion? Okay, Patty, roll call, please. Briere? Yes. Goldschlag? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Edgepeth? Aye. Kincaid? Aye. Thank you. Much Thank appreciated. You. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. And now we are on to item 6.2. Final design review, Round Barn Village at Zero Round Barn Boulevard, file number DR18-069. I'll go ahead and turn it over to staff for a presentation. Uh, thank you, Chair Kincaid and Design Review Board members. I'm Gary Broad, I'm a contract planner working for the city. And this is a follow-up to the hearing that the Design Review Board had on November 15th of last year on this application. And at that time, the Design Review Board considered both preliminary and final design review for this application. The Design Review Board went ahead and approved the preliminary design review application for this project and requested that it be brought back to a subsequent DRB meeting uh, with additional uh, information 
provided um, as part of the project review. And specifically, DRB asked that the final design review address the following, uh, that a detailed landscape plan, including specific fence design, be provided, that the design submitted for, uh, that design be submitted showing pool and other amenity buildings, that the applicant consider simplification of architectural details at porches, canopies, and second and third floor building volumes, that a lighting plan be submitted compliant with the preliminary design review submittal requirements, that the applicant consider enhanced paving at crosswalks leading from the main arteries, I'm sorry, the main entries, um, and finally, that stronger accent colors be considered. In response to these comments, the applicant team has submitted um, additional plans for detailed landscaping slash fencing design, um, pool and other amenity buildings, um, and a detailed lighting plan. Uh, the applicant has uh, been requested to provide a narrative responding to all six of the comments that DRB made at its last meeting, um, and the applicant uh, will be addressing that at the meeting, uh, either with a handout or verbally tonight. Um, Planning and Economic Development is recommending that the Design Review Board by resolution approve the final design review for the Round Barn Village. I'd be happy to answer any questions from DRB and additionally we do have uh, uh, the applicant's elevation um, plan submittal that we can uh, put up uh, if DRB members wish to be able to look at anything um, on the uh, projected screen. And we have uh, Charity Wagner here representing the, uh, the uh, project. Excellent. Thank you very much for the presentation. You're welcome. Uh, questions for staff and any preference to have the plans um, posted up on the live screens? I have no questions for staff, but I would want the plans posted. Okay, we can do that. We're, we're trying to find it on the computer first. It's all right, Eric's gonna try and break the system real quick. He's fine. <laughs> I know. DR, I know. maybe, is it one of you? Did you change your name? Oh, just have a thing like that. Yeah, it doesn't always put when we need her. going to load that onto the computer in just a moment. <laughs> As we're working through that, if there's any, uh, do you have questions for staff, Eric? None. This is a big one to jump into, Adam, so any questions for staff? <laughs> I'm working my way through, but uh, nothing at this time. All right. Warren? None. And I have no questions for staff. Uh, we are not able to find it on the computer and our secretary has left the building, so. <laughs> uh, Government shutdown. Right. I don't know if you want to take maybe a five minute Are we able to open the break? I, I, I think we can, uh, yeah. We can figure out a, a way to do this. Um, Charity, did you want to address the changes no, just yeah. verbally and we can kind of walk through our plan set and use my iPad here and just face this. Too bad. 
Do they have the plants on them? is just the plants we got in the packet. So uh, the applicant did mention that the plans of what she's going to be showing are what were in your packet. Yes. So um, we can also just reference uh, while she's talking so you can pull it up on your iPad. It's another option. That's a good I one. think whatever is most expedient uh, will work for us. Just let us know what attachment you're on and what page and Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. I thought we had this all squared away earlier today, but uh, without further delay, you all have been at this since about 12 o'clock today, I hear, so I will be expeditious but thoughtful. Um, tonight's meeting, as Gary mentioned, is the final design review. On uh, November 15th, uh, your board approved the preliminary design review and asked us to come back with some select items. So um, for the newer members, I regret that you were here on the 15th, but you get to see maybe more of the icing pieces, if you will. Um, so from the top, the first sheet in your packet is a color 11 by 17 that shows the pool area. Um, the intent of this submittal was to provide you with the items that you requested and in large part that surrounded the structures um, around the pool and a little bit more um, information on how the pool is going to be laid out in the ex pool accessory buildings. So there is a single story um, pool structure that is at the entrance to the pool building and it is it kind of provides um, a gateway into the pool. You walk through a breezeway to get in to the pool area. Um, the fencing around the pool includes, um, I guess on this same sheet, you're looking at, um, it's called Community Center Round Barn Village. And on the bottom of there, it details the retaining walls. Um, at the last meeting, there was a lot of question with respect to, um, are y'all following me? Do you want me to come look at your screens and make sure we're all on the same page? Good, okay, good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It looks, I think, or just try attachment five. Staff report. Attachment five. Attachment five. Final DRC. Great. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So, um, the retaining walls at the bottom of this page, there was some discussion about the uh, retaining walls at the last meeting, and the intent of this was to show that the walls are a, I'll call it geogrid type um, wall that allows for the walls to be planted, so you're not looking at a very solid wall surface. And then on the top of that wall is a required uh, safety rail, um, which we're proposing like a very simple kind of gable steel rail. The intent of that is for that to kind of disappear. We don't really want that to be a feature, but it is required to have. Um, in addition, there is a, the next page, the pool building. This sheet shows the details for the um, pool enclosure wall. There is a solid masonry wall on the sides of the pool, if you will, um, call it east and west. Um, on the back of the community area, that um, on the northern portion, if you will, is a proposed uh, wrought iron pool enclosure fence. And the intent of changing that from stucco to wrought iron is because there's actually quite nice views looking out that direction. Um, and then there's also a, um, a spa that is on the, I suppose, west side of the, of the community center. Um, that wall is a masonry wall with two kind of arbor structure on either side. And then there's also in the pool area is a, what we're calling an outdoor kitchen with a, a couple of barbecues and a countertop for um, cooking and preparing foods. Uh, the next sheet is shows the, the landscape structures exhibit. So in addition to additional information about the 
pool area itself, um, the types of walls that were there, and the, the pool building itself. There was some question about other landscape structures. Our plans in the November meeting showed arbors and um, had call-outs for an entry monument, but the details of that weren't quite um, elaborate at that point. So we were asked to come back with more information on those. So this exhibit shows where all those are located. Um, there are um, about, I would call five different features. So there's the entry monuments that exist on the two main points of access to the project site on the east and west side. There are um, what we call Paseo entry features. So as you're walking into the courtyards, there's a like a monumentation feature there. Then there are um, overheads, um, uh, like a arbor structure again in the gardens and at the main entrance park area. Um, and those are detailed. The next two sheets are enlargements of the landscape structure exhibit because it's a bigger site, just makes it kind of difficult to follow where those features are proposed. And if you flip to the sheet called landscape structure exhibit that shows all the four various arbors, you can see that we're looking at um, an entry monument. So on both, both of the driveway entrances, there'll be arbors on either side of the main entrances, vehicular entrances to the site. And then on one of them, there'll be a flanking um, a monument sign that will say round barn. It'll be lit up a little bit at the bottom. There are also um, Paseo entry arbors, we call them. So these actually have light fixtures on them. Um, and it's at the entrance to each of the Paseos in the project, kind of highlighting this is how you enter and to get into the individual units. And then there are also larger arbors proposed at the main park entrance to the site. On the um, east side of the site, as you drive in, there's a large open space area there. And we have intended to put a larger arbor to provide shade for people to kind of gather out there. And there's also one proposed in our community garden. And then uh, the last ones we called overhead arbors are um, proposed in a few of our smaller parklets throughout the site. The next exhibit is walls and fences. This is also broken in half too to show a little bit more detail. There are about four different types of walls and fence details. There's the retaining wall, which we discussed a little bit with respect to the pool. There's the retaining walls in the site are largely adjacent to the community rec area, and then also they run along the southern portion of the site where the access road is. All of those walls are the same geogrid type, plantable wall with a guardrail on top, and they vary in height from about six feet. The largest one is 20 feet. That's the one behind the, the rec center. The, there are also patio walls. We show the details on the different types of um, fence detail as you walk through the Paseo. And then the fence around the community garden, and there are a couple low planter walls. The next two sheets are, again, those kind of call-outs showing you in more detail where those wall types are. And the detail sheet itself shows the detail of the um, guardrail proposed for the top of the retaining walls. The um, the end units of each patio, so in each townhome uh, building, whether it's a four or eight unit townhome building, the end units will have a solid masonry wall, and the interior units will either be this horizontal fence type or the vertical patio fence type. So each, every building will have a combination of all three different types of fence type. Um, and then also in the project, there are these low planter walls, just kind of provide some relief um, within a couple of our few uh, parklets, which are shown on the previous exhibit. And then the garden fence is proposed to be a wire mesh and wood fence around the community garden that's on the east end of the project. We are also showing all of the um, tree planting um, and shrub planting. So the next two sheets are a color-coded tree type um, plan to show actually three sheets. We broke this one up into three. Um, this is the far west side of the site. You can see the various layers of planting we've picked. Oaks, largely, um, and pistache, Chinese pistaches are street trees throughout the site. And then in each of the individual um, park-like areas, we've gathered trees to make them a little bit more individual. For example, this um, the children's play area that's at the, I would call it, northwest portion of the site. This is an elm tree-focused area. And then the park area south of that um, by units 214 and 204. This is more of a sycamore themed planted area. So 
we were intentionally selecting trees for the different park areas to provide some individuality, but also providing a more common um, plant landscape. Um, I did check in today with the architect, landscape architect who made it very clear that the trees and shrubs and ground cover and everything on site is um, compliant with the city's living with fire, firewise uh, landscape planting. Um, it's been incredibly important to us from the get-go. And then also that we are wheel compliant um, as well. Obviously, we, we have to be, but it's uh, there. I've had experience where there's a disconnect between what we're showing and what we're saying. So we're getting it right the first time here. <laughs> um, or I guess this would be the third time, right? Because this is conceptual, then preliminary, now fine. Um, but you follow me. And then we also wanted to take time to show um, the entry feature area so you can see how the patios will front onto the main entrance and how the yards work in relationship to um, yards, the front patios, I'm calling them yards because some of them are quite big. And then there's a planter area between the patios and the sidewalks, kind of providing some separation. We also show the tree spacing and tree types in each of these um, enlargements. And we did the same for one of our parklets, the what we're calling our children's play area. And what I think is most noticeable here is that in a lot of um, townhome projects, we don't have the benefit of really providing a substantial planter area between the patio wall and the sidewalk. These projects get really tight. And so we've taken the time to make sure that we have at least a four foot planter area there so we can get a good sized tree and provide a nice separation between the private patio fence and the, and the walkway. Let's see, site lighting. Um, we spoke a little bit about site lighting at the last meeting, but we didn't quite have enough um, information to show where all the proposed lighting was located. So we did take time to do that in this um, submittal. So we're showing our street lights, our park, uh, excuse me, lighting in the parks, all of our bollard locations, as well as the details of those lights specifically. We also get down to the, what we call more landscape lighting, kind of uplit lights for trees and, um, the planter walls, as well as the signage out near the monument um, at the entries. And the light specifications that we chose, which are shown, so this exhibit shows in color where all the street lights are located and where all the bollards are located, and then in this area here shows the spec for that individual light. And so what we did here was give a thought to, <laughs> it's making me laugh, so sorry. We gave a lot of thought to, um, the types of fixtures that we're picking, trying to be um, compatible with our, what we're calling our modern farmhouse aesthetic. Uh, I think I mentioned last time, all lighting on site is private um, and will be maintained by the Common Homeowners Association as part of the project. And then the last two sheets are a floor plan and elevation of that pool building, which we talked a little bit about. So you can see that it has um, the breezeway through the center with a gate at the back, so it does provide a protection. Nobody can just run straight into the pool. Um, and the, this building largely captures um, restrooms and shower facilities. Um, there are direct, very strict requirements between how large your pool is, drives how many showers and bathrooms you need, so we've made sure we're consistent with those requirements here. And then the types, the materials and the features on here, we also are um, respectful and harmonious to the types of materials that you saw on the buildings which you presented last November. So I. I'm hopeful that this provides a more level of uh, confidence and comfort in the, the, detail, the more finer details of the project. Um, we are moving full steam ahead through an improvement plan process. Um, for this project, we are very excited to build townhomes in Fountain Grove. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, see if we can get to uh, um, our next step here. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Um, before questions, I'm gonna go ahead and open up public comment and then immediately close it since there's no one left in the room. Um, and with that, Sabra, questions for the applicant. Well, first, I really want to thank you for the thoroughness of, of this presentation. Um, I know that when we last saw you here, uh, we understood where you were headed, 
but we didn't have the details and that was, those details really mattered to us. Um, I don't have any questions, I only have comments, and so I'll pass to the next person. Eric, any questions? None, thank you. Adam, again, large one to jump right into. Any questions? Uh, sure, I do have a question off the bat. Um, from a landscape perspective and the trees perspective, um, am I correct in seeing that it's it's uh, you have them uh, broken up by zones and street er, uh, treat er, t excuse me long day uh, tree types um but i don't see quantities on here that am i correct in seeing this that's you uh, right, the, the table does not um, total the number of trees that are proposed, um, but that they are shown graphically. Yep. Um, I guess it, uh, not, I guess it's more of a comment. So mm -hmm. should I hold it till later or ask now? Comments later. Comments. Questions later. I will now. Hold my comment for later. Thank you for answering my question. Warren, questions? No questions. And I have no questions. Yeah. So, uh, board, does anyone have a uh, motion to make? Oh, no, we make motions. <laughs> I'll second. I'd like to make a motion. Um, forwarding disarmy view with no conditions other than accepting the said package which has been submitted and affirming that the intent and heart of the applicant will execute said work as drawn. And this would be for file number DR18-069. Yeah, if we, if we could uh, read, re read the resolution into the record. <laughs> <laughs> so to clarify, Warren, you would like to uh, make a motion to approve the resolution of the Design Review Board of the City of Santa Rosa granting final design review approval for the attached housing for the Round Barn Village located at zero Round Barn Boulevard. Assessor's parcel number is 173-020-030 through 173-020-036, file number DR18-069, and you would like to waive the reading of the text? Indeed, yes. And do I have a second? Second. Second by Sabra. Okay, discussion. Um, Sabra. So my initial comment is, uh, again, I really thank you for the details. I'm particularly impressed by the details of the lighting. Um, one of the things that I didn't expect was the level of innovative lighting. And um, that you're, you're emphasizing localized low-level lighting in many places that provide a sense of safety and interest for uh, the residents without becoming too bright or, or spending too much energy illuminating only streets makes me very pleased. Um, I do think you missed a step by not saying how many of which kinds of plants are going to be planted. The schematic is very interesting to me, but it's this green circle could be any one of those trees. And um, that does not help me as, as a person who's not a landscape architect get a sense of the balance or the um, best use of space, which is too bad. Um, beyond that, though, I'm just, I think that you've brought it back to where it needed to be in detail. Um, I know that there's always going to be concern about exiting. You have two exits, they go onto the same road, and th that single road exits onto a single road, and there isn't an easy second route and this is an area that's um, in people's minds as a fire risk. But you're constrained by the space you have to play with. Um, again, I think you did a reasonably good job of uh, 
working with what you have, working for the audience you have, and creating a, a, a higher density housing in this area. Eric, comments? Um, I'm very excited for this project. Uh, I think it's uh, great. Uh, we do not have a lot of townhome projects in Santa Rosa, and it provides for a more affordable housing, uh, even though marketplace, uh, it's, less, it's less expensive than single family residences. So I am very excited about this project. I think it provides some much needed housing for some of the major employers that are in that area, such as Medtronic, Keysight, Kaiser, um, and uh, that has certainly been in the discussion for many uh, committees here in the city. In the city. So uh, it, it's a great project. Uh, I'd like to see it shovels in the ground as soon as you can. So thank you. Adam. Okay. <laughs> uh, judging from my question, you probably know where I was going or with my comment. Um, uh, as Sabre was saying also, um, the, I, I also appreciate the going down to the level of detail uh, for of details and specifications on the lighting, but um, the trees and landscapes, um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I would want to see, I appreciate the, the variety and diversity of plantings that you're having, but I would want to see a, a more detailed um, planting plan. Um, and again, I don't know if that is, so would come later if that's in the next step. It's not, we're not supposed to get to that step yet. I don't know if I'm jumping the gun. Um, go ahead. I was just gonna say, this is the final step, so. Okay, yeah, <laughs> so if this, if this is the final step, um, <clears throat> with the amount of, of trees and plantings you have, the diversity, um, I, I would wanna see where the actual plants are going. What, it, I, I want to see it really spective, because with so, so you, you could run the risk, you know, you know, uh, you could run the risk of having either you know, fifteen pistachios in a row and then fifteen olives in a row, something like that. I would want to see the diversity. I would want to really see how it's laid out. I would want to see some specs also um, and details of, uh, you know, you you call out bioswale trees. I'd want to see what you mean by a bioswale. Um, I want to see a detail of that because bioswale had certainly has a, a meaning um, of you know stormwater catchment filtration, detention, retention, and so I'd want to see where those are and what they are and what area they're going to collect water from, um, and uh, and for, you know ground covers. I'd want to see if if you're having zones that are either diversity of species or if you're having swaths of species, um, things like that. Uh, with the children's play area, as you call it, um, it's, I'm seeing smaller trees. I'd want to see more shade trees um, in, incorporated into that, um, especially in that, that part of town, especially on that aspect on the hillside. Um, if it is you know, a play zone, of really having protected um, for small humans. Um, and another question on the community garden aspect. Um, so we got a pretty large development here, and this, um, you know, you got a couple of dozen um, planter beds for, uh, you know, a couple of hundred um, residences. You know, there's going to be demand for those, um, and it feels somewhat uh, a, a, a kind of a token. Um, uh, a, you know, sort of uh, community garden aspect there, which, you know, uh, that's can also be fine. And say, I'm not saying that we need to have surround everything with farms or many, many um, planter beds, but it's a it's a, a small community garden for a pretty large development, um, small play area for pretty large development, too. So um, from a landscape and uh, plant perspective, I'd want to see a, a bit more detail. Um, that's my comment. Thanks, Adam. Warren? I just want to comment. I've, I've been here historically for the entire project, and what was exactly asked of you in the last submittal was really given. I, I'm not a licensed landscape architect, but just carefully said, you have a complete species list of all 
the monocots, dicots, the grasses, the, the whole range, shrubs all the way through trees. My entrust with this project, and I've been on record, is that you've, you've looked at Wheelow, at Sioux Sump, Stormwater, North Coast. There's been a litany with the engineer, the civil, in concert with uh, C2 Collaborative to understand collectively what it means to marshal a project with, with flooding issues um, and, and all the above. I would propose that in great respect and courtesy of the applicant that what I see is sufficient. It's a Herculean that the graphics alone to cover this ground are a serious, not just a stab, but a full campaign of intent here. That there's integrity belong belief, and I, lo I love plants, but um, I work on projects myself where lighting isn't an exact science. There's foot candles as low as 0.5 or 5. Can you find your car keys at 2 a.m.? There, there are spikes in lighting where it goes to 11 foot candles. Your dark sky compliant. I would hazard there's about 36 different categories of compliance you have marshaled and put together. I want to even remark, um, in the architecture, I, I had talked about gables and um, some of the uh, craftsman um, outriggers, and you exactly, to the T, um, located all types of construction and character as, as we'd asked. I don't know a thing in this package that I can see. I, I would historically say that this is the most compliant package we have ever seen for what we've asked for. It is large and it's easy to perhaps concern that in an act of God storm, if we have a nine inch storm instead of a six inch storm, will a tree suffocate underwater too much that's in a swale? Is the, is the tree swale worthy? I, I'm just gonna call it that I, I believe that we owe it to you um, in all respect to endorse and forward this project in its exact submittal and that your judgment in the field of how to execute said uh, profiles of soil, friable, parts sand, parts loam, you're gonna do it. That's my comment. Thank you, Warren. Um, I understand the concerns of a couple of board members that have made uh, their remarks on the landscape plan, so I can't say that the landscape plan count isn't there and it's not 100% clear where things go, but I uh, echo all of Warren's comments in total and being that it's nine o'clock, um, I probably won't say anything other than I agree that this package is probably the most complete that we've ever seen and it is a large project and deserved to be very complete and I appreciate you uh, taking it to task and you've got a great design team and I know that uh, you will execute the plan, so uh, well done. Look forward to seeing it up on the hill. Um, so motion's been made as is, seconded as is, so let's go ahead and have a roll call. Briere? Yes. Goldschlag? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Hedgepeth? Aye. Kincaid? Aye. Excellent. Well, thank you for your patience in the process and uh, for seeing it through to the end. And again, let's let's get shovels in the ground. Excited, the exciting part, right? <laughs> okay, uh, we are on to item number seven: board member reports. And since there was none earlier, I'm guessing there's none now. Um, and Jessica, did you think of any other department reports that you wanted to make? Uh, no, and I will uh, not repeat myself so we can all go home. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to uh, thank uh, staff and Patty uh, in particular again for the uh, meal, much appreciated, and the snacks, and for the long day. So um, thank you very much, and we are adjourned. Thank you.